optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I answer your personal question? Now it is in a perfect time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over metal endoskeleton. This episode is brought to you by Audible, which I've used for many, many years. I absolutely love audiobooks, and they are one of my favorite ways to pass the time when I travel. I'm on the road all the time, and Audible allows me to consume many more books than I possibly could otherwise. I have two audiobooks to recommend right off the bat. The first is perhaps my favorite audiobook of all time, and it's the only audiobook I've wanted to listen to twice in a row, The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. It's amazing, and you will thank me. There are a few different versions. I like the version that Neil narrates himself. One of the most soothing voices of all time. The second book is Vagabonding by Rolf Potts, P-O-T-T-S, which had a huge impact on my life and formed the basis for a lot of what would later become the four-hour work week. So go to audible.com forward slash Tim and you can choose one of these two books or any of many, many other options. That could be books, magazines, and much more. As a listener of The Tim Ferriss Show, you can also access a free 30-day trial. Just go to audible.com forward slash Tim. You can't make more time, but you can make the most of it. So turn your travel or your commute into something more with a free trial at Audible. Go to audible.com forward slash Tim to start now and get your free 30-day trial. This episode is brought to you by Wealthfront. Wealthfront is the future of financial advice. They've become incredibly popular among my friends in Silicon Valley and across the country because they provide the same high-end financial advice that the best private wealth managers deliver to the ultra-wealthy, but for any account size and at a fraction of the cost. For instance, they monitor your portfolio every day across more than a dozen asset classes to look for opportunities to rebalance or harvest tax losses. Now, would you do the same? Are you doing the same? Probably not. And the power is in the software. Wealthfront now manages more than $4 billion in assets, which is up from around $2.5 billion when they started advertising on this podcast. They're growing incredibly quickly. Unlike old-fashioned private wealth managers, Wealthfront is powered by innovative technology, making it the most tax-efficient, low-cost, hassle-free way to invest. They don't have bloated sales teams or retail locations, so they can deliver all of this sophisticated financial advice and these services at a fraction of the cost of a traditional financial advisor. So at the very least, go to wealthfront.com forward slash Tim and take their free risk assessment survey. It only takes a couple of minutes and Wealthfront will recommend a personalized portfolio of investments. In other words, they'll tell you exactly where they would put your money. So even if you don't use their service, you have a huge leg up and you have additional information for making good decisions. They use investment theory to automate good financial behavior and decisions that people typically don't make but should. So go to wealthfront.com forward slash Tim to get your first 15K managed for free or just to get more details. Check it out, wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show. By the way, long time no see. Literally in Chinese is exactly the same. Long time no see. Anyway, I digress. The Tim Ferriss Show is about deconstructing world class performers to tease out the habits, routines, favorite books workouts, et cetera, that you can use. And we talk to people from all walks of life, chess, entertainment, athletics, military, you name it. This time around, we are going to name someone who has previously only gone by a pseudonym in this podcast. We called him Victor, I think, in the episode where Naval Ravikant and I spoke about this mythical sounding Polish weight trainer world champion, world record holder who had helped us to completely revolutionize our bodies. And now you're going to have a name, Jersey Gregorek. Who is Jersey? Well, Jersey Gregorek immigrated to the US together with his wife, Aniela, who also holds multiple world records, from Poland in 1986 as political refugees during the Solidarity Movement. And an accomplished athlete, 
He subsequently won four world weightlifting championships, that's Olympic weightlifting, and established one world record. In 2000, Jersey and Aniela founded UCLA's weightlifting team, becoming its head coaches. They are the co-creators of the Happy Body program, which everybody should check out, thehappybody.com. Jersey has been mentoring people for more than 30 years, and the case studies will blow your mind. We talk about a number of them in this episode. In 1998, Jersey earned an MFA in writing from the Vermont College of Fine Arts. His poems and translations have appeared in numerous publications, including the American Poetry Review. His poem, Family Tree, was the winner of Amelia Magazine's Charles William Duke Long Poem Award in 1998. So he is a killer he can do full ass to heels Olympic snatches with a loaded barbell on an Indo board that is a wobble board. And he is currently, uh, I would say, 62, maybe 63 years old. We'll get into it. And uh, Naval, who introduced me to Jersey, traveled down with me to his house and his gym, Naval Ravikant. At Naval, N-A-V-A-L on Twitter, is the CEO and co-founder of AngelList. He previously co-founded ePinions, which went public as part of Shopping.com and Vast.com. He is an angel investor and has invested in more than 100 companies. He's one of the best investors in Silicon Valley. I call him all the time for advice. And he has been involved with more than a few unicorn mega successes. His deals include Twitter, Uber, Yammer, Postmates, Wish, Thumbtack, and OpenDNS, which Cisco not long ago bought for $635 million in cash. So Naval in Jersey, two of the most intense people I know. And we have a three-person conversation over Marco Polo black tea, which is Jersey's one and only favorite tea. So please enjoy this very wide-ranging conversation with the most intense Jersey Greg Rack. Jersey, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so we're sitting here with Jersey, aka Victor, and Victor was the name that Naval and I came up with to to disguise Jersey previously and we're sitting here at his home where he also has his gym about I would say 100 feet from where we're sitting in a separate building. Naval, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, the previous episodes we recorded were great, but the number one follow-up question I always got was, who's Victor and what's the morning workout routine? <laughs> so we're here with Victor, a.k.a. Jersey. <laughs> I like Victor. Yeah. <laughs> it goes to victories. So, yeah, yeah, Victor and victory. <laughs> and we were talking earlier about uh, how losing is not fun <laughs> and you must win. Yeah, must when do you get everything fantastic. required to win. <laughs> so... Uh, I was was hoping maybe you could talk about Jersey a little bit. A video we were watching earlier. We were watching a video, I think, of one of your clients who's seventy four. Is that right? He has right. two hip replacements and a shoulder replacement, and he was doing uh, high speed snatches, All Olympic right. snatches, faster than I can certainly even attempt to do them. How do you get someone in that condition to be able to do something like a snatch? So he came here ten years ago. He was 64, and uh, he was uh, in pain. He was fat. He was aged and uh, not good. So I started simply working with him, putting him on a happy body program, and uh, try first to recover his flexibility. So his flexibility was the, my first aim. So in about uh, a year, he uh, gained all the flexibility and uh, I brought him from 20 inches squatting to on a on a bench to 19, 18, and 16, and 12, and and finally finally he could do the whole thing. So then I started really working with him on the full uh, squat press. And then took uh, about a year, and he could do actually the movement. This is where you squat into the bottom position and then press the weight overhead. Yeah, you squat, you press, and you stand up. So that position uh, requires complex flex flexibility because you have to be flexible in the ankles, you have to be flexible in your hips and hamstrings, and the spine has to be arched, and so the shoulders are not really getting any uh, pressure, and the arms are straight up vertical. So it's not an... It's beautiful movement. So if you do this movement, uh, you can do anything in life. Yeah, but squat press is a static movement, so it is not yet uh, dynamic movement. 
And life sometimes requires from us dynamic movements, right? So uh, about two years ago, I started working with him with dynamic movements. So it's about eight years. And then we, I brought him to this full capability, uh, flexibility, like, you know, one year old. He's <laughs> in that place. <laughs> Amazing. So, uh, you know, with two hip replaced and, and no shoulder, so he was limited, but it didn't really uh, matter at all. So I adapted to uh, his problem and then made, you know, inch by inch, uh, his body better and more flexible. Once he was ready, then I started doing the uh, snatch drops dynamic movements when actually the bar flies a little bit. It's the first time. And that is when you have the bar across your back, like you're going to be doing a back squat and you, you effectively bounce a few times and then the bar stays where it is, but you drop down into a... Yeah, there's a, it's a kind of like combination of the jerk when you have the bar on the neck and you jump slightly and then you do two jumps, so the two jumps are uh, uh, the way as the third one is, so you don't uh, exaggerate on the third one, it's on purpose that way. Right. So you learn not to overdo. So when the third jump happens, you, you jump up, but you go down to the full squat, and you receive the bar there. So that's the snatch drop, kind of jerk combination and the snatch. It's uh, the first approach, dynamic approach to the uh, to to uh, develop the capability to the snatch. All right. Once you have that nailed, you know, really good, perfect. Right. So then you bring the bar to the. Uh, then you do the snatch drop from that point. It means the bar is on your back. You don't jump, you snap down and block. So if you're really good on that, the bar lowers down itself slightly like one, two inches, but you're already down there to block it, to receive it, if you're very fast. So the speed becomes really important here. So when you're really fast, you can do that. But that is before you do the snatch. When you do that really great, then you snatch is the next one. So the bar comes now in the front of you, in the hip joint, and you uh, holding it in front of you. Now you jump three times, but the third one, you let the bar go, and you go under, and you block. And you have to be very fast to block and not to overpull. So I have to coach somebody not to overpull. That's why I came out with these three jumps. So the you do jump one, two, and three, you go under. So you don't focus on overpulling the bar. Meaning pulling it too high. Too high, yeah. So you know the uh the lifter that uh pulls the bar the the lowers is the best one. So the gap between uh the the gap between when you sit in a snatch position and how high the bar is pulled, thrown up, is that gap that says, it tells us how good weightlifter is. So that should be about four inches, five inches, but people who have 10 inches, they, they just waste uh, a lot of, so they are not really great lifters. And then they compensate a lot. And if they improve that, it would be better. So we, we are coming back to our 74 year old. So his gap is about five inches. He's fast, he's 74, and he comes and he stands here and he says, you know, I've been coming here for 10 years. I was 64 when I came. And then, then he adds, you know, and uh, I am 74 and I am a lot of better than I was 64. Actually, I couldn't do this when I was in 20s. So... He's 74, and he does full capability snatch. So you can imagine that he can do anything in his life. It really doesn't matter. He can ski, he can do golf, whatever, because that is the most difficult, really, movement on, on this planet. 
and he can do it. So he will be doing this at probably 84 and 94, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah? So uh, he's really fantastic quality life is in front of him. So I want to I wanna add something, then I want to ask you something, Naval. So a few points. So we, just before we started recording, I wanted to see how how far I had fallen in a bad way <laughs> because I haven't been here in some time. We went into the garage and we looked at, like you said, the angles in that that bottom position, among other things, of the uh, the press squat where I'm pressing the weight overhead and then going down into an overhead squat um, as to the grass. And historically, you've taken video and photographs and you've looked at the exact angles at the hip, at the knee, at the ankle, at the shoulder. And you pointed out one thing that I need to work on, uh, which makes sense, is given my shoulder issues and so on, but also my inflexibility, working on that thoracic, that, that mid-back mobility so that I'm not straining the shoulders. What I, what I find so fascinating, one of the many things I find fascinating about your approach is, and we're going to come back to this, but I'm going to go to Naval next, is that you are very good at micro-progression. So like you said, you, you might have someone come in and they start doing a, a squat, but you want them to do it technically correct. So if they're inflexible, you might have them squatting down only a few inches and then very gradually over time or stepping onto a box that's only a quarter inch. And um, we might come back to this, but you have a, a patient. There are a lot of people who train elite athletes and they basically babysit mutants. Yeah, and they take a lot of credit for it. But you have, uh, I've seen you work with patients with cerebral palsy who have just gone through complete transformations, really amazing. And uh, the, the concept of micro progressions, among other things, is, is, is really grasped my attention in working with you. But Naval, I thought I would just ask, what have you learned from Jersey? Or what do you take away? Aside from these amazing conversations over Marco Polo black tea, which <laughs> yeah. we always have, and I'm already sweating because it gets me all amped up. So mostly I, I just live in fear of Jersey. Um, so even though I send my friends to him and my cousins and my, uh, relatives, I myself try to avoid him because he's a, he's a fearsome taskmaster and I'm not even sure I'm up to it. Uh, but the now <laughs> just, Whoa, you did, on. you did gift me my first visit, to Jersey, which when I think is crazy. Yeah. And I do that. And I do that with a lot of people and I've definitely gifted more visits to Jersey than I've actually undertaken myself. Uh, but uh, what's interesting, what was really impressive to me about Jersey, uh, is that he's an incredible role model. And he's a role model in the sense of, if you don't mind my asking on air, how old are you now, Jersey? 62. 62. And how much do you weigh? Uh, 135. And give me some stats on what you can press or squat. And oh, I can squat about 250 to 60. I can snatch about 80 kilo now. So 80 kilos, like almost 200 pounds. Yeah, like 176. One, yeah. Clean and drag about 100 kilo to 20. And uh, what's your body fat? Below 6%. So. Below 6%? Right. And Jersey can also, I've seen video of Jersey doing a full snatch on top of an Indo board, which is a wobble board. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and, and what are your gymnastic credentials? I, I didn't do gymnastics. I, uh, when I was in Poland, uh, I wanted to be a gymnast, but there was no gymnastic team around. So there was nowhere to go to really learn that. But I really love gymnastics. I, I did all this stuff uh, by myself on grass somewhere, you know, and I really love that. And, and give us a sense of some of the medals you, you hold. Well, I have um, four, I won four weightlifting championship world. Yeah. And my national records, I sent you the, the link. Yeah. My national records that I set up in US uh, in 1999, I think, they're still there. So there are two of them. So 17 years, nobody beat them. <laughs> wow. So I held a record for 17 years, 6% body fat, uh, incredible stats in weightlifting and gymnastics, 62 years old. Uh, inspiration to me, because when you look at a great physique, a great body, that's something that cannot be bought. That's something that can't be bargained. It can't be negotiated. It can't be inherited. And at 62, I don't, you know, you can argue whatever genetics you want, but there's an enormous amount of work and self-discipline that goes into it. So to me, Jersey and his wife, Aniela, who is also a similar character or inspirations, because they world say- record holder. Yes. Uh, and they, they basically says to me, there are no excuses. 
And on top of it, they run a reasonably successful business. Uh, they're poets. Jersey has many, many volumes and volumes of poetry. He has an MFA in creative writing. Um, they're uh, refugees from the solidarity movement in Poland and the fall of the Iron Curtain there. And uh, he's also a meditator. So when I walked into Jersey's house, I'm always intimidated, a house that he basically built, by the way. Uh, I walk in and there's this guy who's like a lion in his cave or in his den, uh, <laughs> built, you know, ripped, rippling muscle top to bottom, extremely calm, uh, tiptoes out in his socks, serves you tea uh, and reads you poetry. Uh, well, before, in, until he berates you until in the he, gym. Until he, <laughs> and then, and, and, and actually my first meeting with Jersey, he made me t strip down to my underwear, uh, pinched me with calibers, took photos from every direction and basically called me fat in as many words as the English language as he knew how. Well, I didn't call you fat, you were fat. That was also so oddly reminiscent of my own first meeting where he reached across and, and pinched my tit and said, you're too fat. And I said, okay, I think we're going to be friends. <laughs> yeah, so it's so Jersey's uncompromising. Jersey does not accept the new age version of, well, you tried, you tried really hard. It's your genes. You know, you're fat because you have big bones. No, you're fat because you eat too much and because you have no discipline. You're fat because you're a fatalist and you have the wrong mindset. And so Jersey has this, uh, he has a series of books, which I recommend, but uh, he follows this duality of master versus fatalist. And uh, his books are full of phrases like uh, uh, the fatalist will say, I don't trust science when they're making excuses as to why they shouldn't diet or work out a certain way. And Jersey's response is, I acknowledge reality. Uh, so I love these kinds of little phrases he has or where people say that uh, getting older is depressing. Jersey says, no, life can be enjoyable at any age. Um, people say diets don't work. Jersey says every diet works. In other words, you just have to stick to it. So it's, it's more the attitude and the evidence that he presents, which is inspirational. And so I prefer to use him from afar that way. But now I know that I have to get back into it as well and start showing up regularly. <laughs> so, so I don't want to, to bury the lead for people too much. Uh, and we're going to bounce all over the place, but could you describe the, the happy body program, at least what you have a lot of people do in the mornings? How would you describe that? And then I, I have some, and, and I'll just, I'll make- You want the story or you want- a week, Let's do the story. Sure. Why not? All right. Let's go into the story. So um, it happened around uh, 25 years ago when I was in the gym and I was, it was like, you know, a uh, personal trainer in LA and I coach people daily and uh, seven days a week and they still would not- get what I wanted, you know, they would not follow the program. Was this before or after you embarrassed a bunch of huge power lifters by deadlifting this around that with the time. pink shoes more than they could? Okay. <laughs> this around that time. <laughs> so, and you had um, a ponytail at the time. Well, you know, yeah. So <laughs> I, I, I thought that people really have to have some independence that they have to take responsibility for what, uh, they would do. And they would need to be connected to the uh, to the program or whatever the program is, right? So I uh, I thought, okay, we need uh, to de I need to detach myself from them, and I need to uh, create something that they could follow. Has to be measurable. Has to have everything what they would need uh, in their life from the program to have a good life forever, right? So what what is that, right? So how uh, a person needs to be? Well, definitely flexibility came boom first, all right? So you have to have flexibility and you have to have full flexibility. So if something happens in life, you cannot be injured. You are flexible all everywhere. So if you have any, uh, you need any reserves of flexibility, you will have. So that's why today a lot of, uh, athletes are injured because in the training, they don't have flexibility. So they, let's say volley, volleyball players, they do half squat, but not full. But if in the game, in any situation where they jump or uh, they do something that requires more flexibility than they do in the training, 
they'll get injured. Right, they have no margin. For they safety. mess up the yeah, mess up the you know uh, uh, ACLs and all the knees. And usually uh, uh, today, volleyball uh, players, women especially, they have these problems. So uh, it is important that athletes they are training in the gym, and in the gym they are more intense than actually in the games. If that happens, they cannot be injured simply because they have reserve, right? So uh, flexibility first, then certain strength is needed, right? And then uh, certain speed and posture is important here. So the spine is flexible and the spine is healthy because spine is uh, is really uh, the the gateway to health of the legs. So if there's any inflammation, any pressure on between the vertebrae, your legs will have pain, soreness, and so on. Now, okay? not, not to interrupt, but I will. So that's also one of the reasons, is is that not one of the reasons why you recommend the hanging after weight training? Right, decompression. And, and I remember coming in at one point and telling you I had some pain in my leg, and you asked me, did you hang for the last two days? And I said, uh -oh. actually, I, I didn't. Got you. I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Busted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 I trained the cerebral palsy boy and he jumps on three inches back and forth. And he, uh, when he lands back, he cannot bounce off the floor. So I teach him that bounce. Yeah. And he has slow uh, brain and that brain is not really uh, not letting him to bounce off the floor right away. So if he's off a little bit, he will stop that. So I said, bust that. <laughs> and again, all right. And that boy said, bust it. <laughs> so we have this fun. So, um, and I should just say, I mean, on that point on cerebral palsy, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of impressive things in this house and in this gym, but the before and after in that case is just astonishing. Uh, well, I will tell you. Yeah, we, we don't, I don't want to take you off track, uh, but so he, whether he came here, he, um, you know, he barely walked. He didn't have energy to uh, look at you for uh, more than 30 seconds. He, he's never read a book. He's never watched a movie because he didn't have energy, fell asleep right away. And so no energy at all. So uh, when I went with him to the gym and I asked him to press 15 pounds bar, he couldn't lift that bar off the rack. I just... Did, wanted to just simply bench press 15 pounds bar he couldn't lift off the rack 15 pounds and he's 25 year old yeah mature man so he's very weak very weak so i uh i took the bar away and put three pounds so i told the father to go away for a walk and i work with him in the gym and so i did uh he he lifted three pounds so I loaded up, six, he lifted. So I loaded up, 10, he lifted. Brought back 15 pounds, he lifted. So loaded up for 18 pounds and he pressed it. So I said, okay. So the brain has certain situations that when we load it up, he's open to progress and progress is going to be fast. So I asked father to come and watch it. So now it's one year and a half, the boy, Presses 144 pounds. <laughs> wow. <laughs> 144 pounds. So I'm bringing him almost to the, and he is about 160 pounds. So I'm bringing him almost to the place where normal people are. Yeah. So he's That's walking. A lot of normal people. He's squatting 160 pounds. He, uh, so he couldn't really jump on. He couldn't detach himself from the floor at all, even one inch jump. So now he jumps on 11 inches. That's amazing. And every inch when he gets, we, I started from six inches, we have special dinner. So it's a really special something. And he loves it. You know, it's like this celebration. I, I, so we need to celebrate and every inch is a celebration. And uh, he jump on 11 inches, about two months ago. So now he's working for on 12 inches. And there are some changes on the way. Interesting. You know, like one day after half a year when I trained him, his father said, 
he spoke to me in the car. And I didn't know how to relate to it. He said, uh, what does it mean? I was just, oh, because he was always sleeping. And today when we drove, he's, he noticed a car. I said, really? Okay, so I asked Tajen, what was the car? Oh, I don't know. Uh, so, I, so I asked him, okay, next week, see the car and tell me what car it was. So he came back and said, did you see a car? Yes. What was it? Prius. I said, oh, okay. So next week, I asked him about the color and who was the driver. How old was the driver? Driving license. And he started really remembering more, 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 more things, right? And his energy was better and he started talking. And uh, about a, uh, one year after, the father said, we had conversation first time in our life. I said, wow. And then, so the father said, you know, before that, it was only about it's time to go to bed or it's time for dinner. And that's for 25 years. We didn't have any talk. Today, the boy is in the college. The boy reads books. The boy writes. And he also, uh, I work with his mind uh, with poetry. So every time when he comes, he recites one poem. And then I analyze the poem to uh, to see if he's getting, if his uh, logic works. And now we have third time already with the book. And his intelligence, his, uh, his way of, uh, you know, capturing the meaning of the poem improved so much within one year. It, he's almost like kind of a normal person to talk, to have fun, to enjoy you know, uh, interact and so on. So now we are talking about the girlfriend and so on. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what book of poetry did you use? Oh, I used um, Food for Your Soul. So okay. uh, Happy Body, Food for Your Soul. Right, so, yeah. So Jersey has a number of books in poetry, which are kind of interesting. If you've ever wanted to read a poem about someone struggling to resist eating a bagel, <laughs> 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 he's, got, he's got you covered. But they, they're deeply personal poems. There's a lot of pain in here. There's a lot of uh, struggle, a lot of strife. There's... Uh, good perspectives. Uh, I, I saw a good poem you had about doctors struggling with the uh, realization that in today's world, a do your doctor should be healthier and probably healthier and fitter than you. Otherwise, why are you listening to that doctor? It's like a burden they've taken on. These are very human poems, uh, but they're about topics like losing weight, nutrition, getting healthier, lifting weights, and so on. Why did you get into this? Why, why is this your medium and, and how has it served you? Just to pause, can we come back to that? Yeah. Just because I interrupted you yeah. asking about the, your client, but we were talking about happy body. And so I just right. want to make sure we get to happy body. And then we're going to get to the poetry. We'll nail it. No, no. Then we're going to come back to the poetry. So you've covered, you talked about flexibility. You talked about strength. You talked about speed and po and spine and posture. So you talk about the, um, your uh, coaching and, and how your body improved. And when you came, you had you know, some pains, you had flexibility situation problems. So I had to work with you to bring you right into the per perfect posture. Perfect posture means you, you have the bar above the, your head and then you can go down and up vertically without any compromises on your joints. So where the compromises are coming from? So the flexibility that is needed is needed in the, your ankles, in your hips and in your whole spine. The combination synergy of these three is needed to, uh, to really make that movement uh, the right way. So the if the flexibility of the ankle is not right, so the knees are going backward and then your hips are going clockwise. You're gonna compensate. And, and then you start you know, rounding your back, your spine. But that can lead to any problems with uh, sacroiliac and also the spine. So once the uh, ankles flexibility are there, then you move your knees are forward and your hips are moving clockwise. And that gives you this beautiful arch of the spine if the spine is capable of it. If not, so what we notice today with you. So you have ankles flexibility, you have your hips, 
and then the spine is straight instead of you know being like a bow. Right. right. So you now our next thing is about to focus on sternum, focus on arching the spine so you have a really nice bow. And that bow is needed because your arms should be straight up and down. And if the body ends up vertical, then there is no pressure at all on your shoulders. If I have sufficient flexibility in the thoracic spine. Yeah. Right. And uh, just for people who are wondering, so it, what angles are you looking for at the ankle, knee, hip, and so on? Are there are there specific angles? So there is for? about twenty nine degrees between the calves and the and the thighs. Yeah, mm -hmm. the femur. So uh, about twenty nine degrees. Fantastic. So uh, when you look at the real uh, weightlifters that they go very deep, they will have 20 degrees, 21, 22. And usually people will have when they start 50, 55, 60. So degree by degree, you uh, become better. And we talk about before, you remember the winning and the, a small increment. So I like to take people inch by inch or even half an inch because we become happy when we get better. And uh, when I coach, you know, young athletes and they, uh, let's say, I spread everything for two, three years. There was this uh, Russian coach who said, I need 10 years to make a, a national champion. And if I have less time, I will never make one. So I, the same, I see the same way when I see uh, somebody, I see the spread of two, three years, I know where it's going. And I have the time, not that I have the time, the body needs the time to actually get better, all right? Because I follow what the body's adaptation is. So let's say you you lift 200 pounds and another one is 201, right? And I watch how it is. The, the lift should be, uh, it should not use all the powers that you have when you break records. You should have some reserves, like 1% or 2 If you break that way, that the body has the capability to adapt and the whole training becomes fun. It's fun to attack records when you have a little bit of reserve, even though there are your records. So increments should, be, uh, should have reserves and the progress should be set up that way. So you don't burn yourself out and you wait for the adaptation. And uh, so to, so a couple, couple of things real quick. First is that as a prescription for me today, right. we're, I'm going to be doing a press squat, uh, which is where I'm standing, bar on my back as if I'm going to do a back squat. I press it overhead and then I drop down into an overhead squat, kind of ass to the floor. And I'm going to be doing one repetition on every minute for 40 minutes. Right. And... Uh, just to give people an idea of, of, of what a component of my training is going to be. And I'll be doing that every third day. Uh, the, the happy body program that Naval and I have both done in the morning, I'd, I'd love to dig into some of the details of that. And uh, specifically, one of the breakthroughs for me with that program was not holding stretches for too long. And I remember going into a, a number of different stretches. As an example, there's one... And we can't do it full justice via audio, of course, but where you're laying on your back, your legs are completely straight, toes pulled back, and you reach up effectively past your toes with your hands or towards your toes, depending on your flexibility. And I remember, and then you would hold it for, say, half a second, a second, and then come out of it. And you would do, uh, say, six repetitions of that. And I remember then, months later, that was the only stretching that I was doing was that type of stretching in different positions. And I went to a yoga class. I hadn't taken any yoga classes. And it was the first time in my life I was the flexible guy in the yoga class. And it just blew my mind. <laughs> well, I have yoga teachers here. And, <laughs> and they, they really become flexible and they go to teach and they are a lot of better than before. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so uh, how is the, the program composed, this, this, this morning program that you have a lot of people do? So, uh, you know, again, we, we just stop on, you know, where we were going. But uh, uh, there are 18 exercises in the system that about six, six exercises are in a sequence. They are three sequences. The uh, program works that you go from one to another 
exercise in a sequence of six. But the first sequence is the easiest one. So vertically, the program is designed to make you more flexible. So when you go to sequence two, it requires more flexibility. And sequence three is the final. So when you see the final squat the, in the first sequence, the exercise number five, power tower. So that is the most difficult exercise in that whole 18 exercises. The, everything is created and designed to be able to actually to do that. That's the one when you actually do it perfectly. You have capability to be Olympic weightlifter. You can go and do Olympic weightlifting. And if you have this capability, then you can do Olympic weightlifting and everything will be easy for you. And the skills. Yeah, people cannot get Olympic weightlifting skills because they are not flexible. You can not ask somebody who is not flexible to... Uh, to enter the flexibility points that he cannot simply, all right? So uh, now you have the whole program and uh, the program deals with any possible joint that needs to be flexible. And the program deals with also the, uh, the strength that is needed, right? The coordination that is needed. And uh, the every exercise now has six different beats. So the, the system is also mindful and meditative. The whole program is designed to be meditation. And not only that you are getting flexible, you're not only that you're getting strong, but also you stress release, you meditate and you calm down. How is it designed? So you now you have uh, one exercise and you have one repetition. So you, that I introduce singularity of the brain. It means you do one thing at a time. That's like how mantra is. You don't two, you do one. So in the happy body, when you do, let's say, press, or you, you do the, the exercise you describe, you lay on the back and you, you are reaching, yes? Mm -hmm. So first is inhale, and you focus on inhale. Inhale becomes everything, becomes just one thing that you do. Then you flex certain parts of the body for stability. And then the third is the lift. Always you are lifting. The fourth is coming the stretch. And this in the stretch is the stretch. You are reaching for something. You are reaching for more each time. The program also is designed to be progressive, to, be, uh, to deliver progress and not just do exercises and and be mindless and do every time the same thing and not get better over time. You're supposed to be better, like you dance tango, and every year you're a better dancer. But you can dance tango without getting better, sure. right? So you have to somehow be open to that, reaching and be better and measure everything so you, you know you're getting better. That happy body system is created to deliver to you the messages every place and every time that you are getting better. And it's measurable and uh, it, it's imaginable. So you can imagine everything and you can keep the data. After a while, of course, the data becomes uh, uh, so organic that you, are, you don't need navigation if you're on the ocean and you want to go from one island to another one because you, it's organic, you know where you are. So when, when you have the system that is that way and you do that system every day, right, then it creates this capability of knowing that you push too much, that you are sore, where or when you are sore, how to eliminate and so on. Coming back to the one repetition. So the, you are reaching and then you are uh, lowering the, the weight is number five, yeah? And number six, you are exhaling, uh, releasing the tension. So six things you do in every repetition. repetition, right? But everyone is single and separate. So the mindful, mindfulness is 100% on 
on what you do. You are not thinking about your dentist appointment during this time, or you are not listening to the music or something. After a while, you can because you are so aligned with it, mm. right? But it, it's better not to, of course. So uh, uh, it, the the whole thing is designed to be mindful, and uh, meditation happens as well. So sometimes people leave the gym and they space out. They didn't know what happened. What really happened, they meditated for 40 minutes, you know, 30, 40 minutes while doing the program. It's amazing because you do the program, but at the same time, you know, the, the other things happen. So the breathing pattern now, uh, why the breathing is that we hold the breath? It's pranayama breathing, the same uh, as pranayama breathing, holding the breath and then re releasing for the calming down the heart. So uh, when you inhale, you also, in, like in weightlifting, when you inhale, you tense the body and then you lift and you hold the breath. We don't even know that we hold the breath in tennis as well. So when you are just really, before really hitting, you hold the body, the body is, uh, is really uh, tough, yeah, tight. And then hit happens and then release happens. Yeah, I mean, it's in a split, split of the second, but you know, in that split of the second, it happens. So in, in when you do, let's say jerk in, uh, in weightlifting, you hold the breath, you inhale, tight the body, you go down, you throw the body, you relax completely the body system, you go under, you block, you stand up. So, so every repetition in the happy body is created that way. Also, it is created to deliver the joy, the pleasure of doing it. And you have to really get it that way. So when you speed up a little bit, you are passing the time, you're becoming more, uh, you, your anxiety is, in, is increasing and you stop liking it and you want to finish. So that's a really terrible brain. So when it happens to you, you slow down, you become slower and you start enjoying the movement, every breath, every tension, every movement, you lowering, you reaching for something, you love it, you enjoy it. Once you get it, the, the, once you get to the pleasure, you want to repeat the pleasure and repeat the pleasure and repeat the pleasure. That's how training is supposed to be. All anaerobic athletes are that way. They love this training. They are not uh, exhaustive training. It's, it's hard, it's not, you know, like a marathon runner that you run and exhaust yourself. No, in a power training, everything is pleasurable. Even though you lift 300 pounds, but you are ready for it. You are aligned with it. You have some reserves. So you, you do something like a gymnast would do, you know, do flips or whatever it is and loves it. Yeah. So the same way you should train the happy body. So question for you now to get back to what Naval brought up, because I've, I've, I've been curious about this for a long time and I, I want to know the answer. You're very, well, all right. So Naval always says, Jersey, God, that guy's so intense. And then Jersey says, oh, Naval, that guy's so intense. <laughs> so I find that funny. But, but, but Jersey, Jersey's been on best behavior. I did hear a story earlier from Aniela your wife about how your students at one point were keeping track of how many times you said fuck in various lectures and clubs. Oops. <laughs> Oops. But, but you're, you're a very intense guy. You're a very competitive guy. Uh, very data driven. Also, I remember how important that has been when we've trained together, keeping track of all of the numbers. How did poetry come into your life? It seems to be such a big part of your life. Well, you know, I was, um, uh... That happened to me in solidarity, you know, when I was, uh, uh, I was mostly in science uh, in Poland. And uh, when I, I was in Warsaw, I studied fire protection engineering. Fire and, protection engineering? Right. And in the, my fourth year, just before um, finishing the school and, and working on my master's, it was 81, and that was the time when Solidarity and the government were really fighting. Can you describe for people what, what is Solidarity? Or what solidarity was, was the union that was formed in 1980, and it was the first free movement in Poland and was allowed uh, to be legal. So 
when solidarity was formed very fast, where there were 11 million people uh, in solidarity. So the whole movement was to free uh, Poland from from Russia, from communism, really. Yeah. So, um, so I was in the uh, in the in the fourth year now working on my masters, and somebody came because I was the leader of the the whole school, and there were four hundred uh, firemen uh, students as well firemen, yeah, inside. So every year about hundred. So we um, somebody came to me and said they are working on changing the law for the school. So I said, what are you talking about? So he said, you know, uh, I was at the meeting with Solidarity and they said that uh, they're going to make the school paramilitary only. I said, so what does it mean? He said, well, it means that they want to use fire uh, protection, the whole industry, to fight the demonstrations and demonstrations were at that time really high. So a lot of people were on streets and in Warsaw could be half a million people on, on streets and demonstrating yeah, against the, whatever regime was at that time. So, uh, so I said, okay, so what could we do? And then... Uh, so they I, wanted the fire engineers to use, say, water hoses and things yeah, like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the engines uh, colored the water, let's say, spray and and catch people later with uh, with that colors and so on. It's just just everything is uh, w w solidarity was looking for powers, more power, and government as well. So here, government thought about yep. doing that. They wanted you on the government side to fight the anti-communist <laughs> demonstrations and uprisings. Right. They wanted you to switch sides and bring your students with you. Well, you know, the the uh, whole point for me was not really. I you know. I said, okay, we have to go to Solidarity people and, and talk about. So I went and I talked uh, in physics to two uh, teachers and we discussed it. And then, you know, you couldn't imagine strike in, in uh, <laughs> fire protection academy right? because it's, it's just, uh, it's impossible almost, yeah? But also it's possible. So... Um, so we discussed that, and then uh, as the things were progressing, we started aligning ourselves with the students' strike in Poland at the same time. It's just mess everywhere, you know, just 81, uh, just before the Jaruzelski attack, the whole Poland, and it was the time when every, everything went underground. So in uh, uh, we started this uh, strike, and then... Uh, after 10 days of negotiations with the government, the government decided to take us down. And they drove tanks into the academy, took us by force and changed the name of the school. And then they would ask uh, everybody to sign uh, allegiance to the school back. I have some poems about that. So I can read if you want. So uh, that... Uh, and then you could go back, so 400, yeah? And of course, the whole uh, country and fire departments were on strike as well. So it's just everywhere. So they asked us to sign allegiance to the school back. So I didn't sign. So, and about uh, other 80 didn't. About 300 something signed, went back to the school they wanted to form. So uh, that uh, that time after that I was underground. So I, I took the the position of uh, looking after uh, other AT and IT and and our our place of uh, uh, place of meetings was the church uh, and the church uh, in Jolibush and and the priest that came to help us uh, during the strike. His name was Jerzy Popiuszko. I have a poem there written about that too. And he was the priest that the country loved him, loved for, for his uh, words, for his love. 
And that was the first time that is a uh, the goosebumps now. The first time that I was faced with unconditional love. I've never seen it in my life. And I was, you know, 27 and I saw people that they had it. And I was looking at that and trying still uh you know find a way why they are that way that they have some kind of ulterior motives or something yeah <laughs> so you know because i i've never seen it i've i've never seen a person that way so uh i spent 3 years underground and uh, it's 84 uh the government had really enough with jersey and his sermons that they were so inspiring uh, people uh, and so much helping people to uh, to survive all of it, what was happening, and to be uplifted, that they captured him and tortured and, and threw his body into the icy river. And after that, the Poland really mourned a lot. And then uh, it was very, very difficult uh, for me too. And I left Poland in 85, in March, after, you know, the situations with, uh, in the police department and so on. And, you had to and do it to survive. I had to go. Uh, and, and my friend told me, I, 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 was, I was called to the uh, police department and I was waiting for, uh, to go in Szczecin. And this guy comes in. And there is a lot of people. And this guy comes here, and I, I know him. And he's a, he was a weightlifter. I said, I, I, uh, so what are you doing here? So we didn't see each other for about four or five years. He is the lieutenant there, and I don't know. And I am on the other side now, right? <laughs> so he is asking me what, what, what I was there for. And I told him, so he let me check it out. So he went, came back and he said, well, you were assigned to me and you should go and never come back. And I said, yeah, I, I said laughing and I said, Jersey, never come back. You would never come out of this building. You'll never come out. You'll be here. You would stay here. So my goosebumps come, you know, and then I said, all right, it was just lucky day. And I said, all right, thanks, thanks, bye-bye, and we go. So this is the way it And about two months after, I was out. I was in Sweden, and then I in Sweden, because of my involvement now, I'm coming back to poetry, because of my involvement with uh, solidarity people, Mostly they heard and then Jersey and then uh, and the others that they had this uh, Yavorsky, Severin Yavorsky. There were people that they were uh, different. They, you know, they, they were just like uh, loving people I've never seen before, as I said. You know, when you see a, a person that love you con unconditionally it's something completely different it's it's like uh, you you see god you know so when I, I i brushed off some of it and then when i went to sweden uh i i started helping people a lot oh, the solidarity people they su suffered a lot they they waited sometimes for their wives and children and they escaped there and then uh, they were well, hunger strikes and all of that was happening. And I, uh, I had this way of uh, talking to people and helping them uh, emotionally, helping, uplifting them, solving in the head a little bit, changing their attitude so their life could be a little bit better. And there was the psychologist Van der Sai, who uh, noticed that. And she said, you know what, you have a gift that you do something with these people and, and they feel better. So she said, let me open the uh, clinic here and then you will be teaching 
and uh, I, I will be your, your assistant. I said, no, no, I'm going to US. I'm, I'm not staying <laughs> in Sweden. So when she, when she heard that, she said, but if you go, you have to write. And I look at her and say, write. I say, yeah, you need to write because you have something to pass on. And I said, well, I've never written anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she said, well, just go home and write. Yeah. I said, okay. So I went home. That's <laughs> very Jersey-like I, response. I, I took, yeah, <laughs> I took the page. <laughs> and it was funny. Whatever was on that page coming, it was in a verse. I couldn't write anything differently. So you it was tried becoming, to write poetry, you just went to I've write... I've never written any poetry. I've, no, I've, and then I've it never. came out in verse. As a poem. Huh. And I wrote the first poem, Rebirth. So uh, I've written that poem, and then, you know, like, uh, uh, okay. And I, I didn't write another one for a while, but then I went to Germany and then ended up in U.S., all right? When, when I came to U.S., I began reading, uh, uh, writing more poems. And uh, the poems, the first book of poetry became about this, uh, my life, uh, the past life. And then um, about 15 years ago when I was dealing with people and, and I was watching people when they wanted to lose weight and how that is difficult and how that, how people suffer because they cannot, and how people, even though they want to control themselves, even if they won't really badly change, there, is, uh, there are forces inside that ca causes the choosing the wrong things, and they are unable actually to succeed in it. And I saw this suffering here in this room over and over. And then one day, because I thought that poetry is something else, you know, it's not really, uh, it shouldn't have any purpose. You write a poem because you are uh, moved by something or uh, disturbed by something and you, you, you make the poem. It's like Baryshnikov said, you know, I dance and my dance is supposed to disturb and not really uh, make entertainment. It's an art form and it's, it's when you create art, you are disturbed by something. So when I watch people suffering because of uh, the inability of controlling themselves, that emotional intelligence was not kicking in, the attitude would not change. I thought, if they suffer, then they, they need poetry, that they deserve poetry. So poetry is not something more than that. The first time I link poetry to something that, um, that to something like, simple weight loss or something, yeah, right? Because, because poetry is supposed to be not purpose. Right, but in this but, case... But I sense really that pain. How it I sense pain and I sense suffering. Practicality. I, I connected first time a poem to that problem and started writing poems. It took me about four years to write this first book of poetry, the Food for Your Soul. And uh, she had different poems, different situations, some of them... Uh, all of them, they have really one purpose. All of them, they talk to the person and uh, they, they try to connect to that uh, place in a person to come out of the situation uh, w positively. Mm -hmm. So to come out, to solve the problem and become positive and constructive. So every poem has this movement inside. I can read you now a poem, give you sure. the story. Yeah, yeah. which you so, want me to grab the first yeah, book? Yeah, grab the book. All right. uh, let me read it. And I will tell you the situation. Yeah, it's just the first poem. 
do you remember the very what your very first poem you wrote was about? The one that came out in verse when you were just trying to write? I I, I remember, but I cannot decide. <laughs> oh no no! But what was it about? Or about change of the the. You see, that poem was about the journey and about uh, becoming a good person. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the person that is this enlightened person, the mm -hmm. the good and kind person. When I send. Uh, send this poem to Poland. Anjala loved that. And my mother thought that I got crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that I lost my mind. <laughs> it's, it's also, I don't want to take us down a separate track, but it's also worth <laughs> noting that Anjela, so you were married at the time with uh, uh, Anjela, and she suggested you leave by yourself, right? So they wouldn't think that the family was fleeing. Yes, yeah. So there's a lot they more They wouldn't to that. let us go. Yeah, so we'll, we'll probably leave that alone for right now, but let's... Uh, what is the what is the poem that you'd like to recite? All right, so I will tell you first the story about this poem. Every poem has a story, so every poem has the time. It's locked with uh, suffering and and coming out of suffering uh, positively, right? And and do something about it, even though uh, it's extremely difficult. So I just look at uh, at people and they. It's, it's like you do something wrong. You know that you're doing something wrong and you keep doing something wrong and you, come out, you cannot come out of that, yeah, right? So these are the situations usually that uh, inspired me to write the poem. So this poem is about a woman, a nurse in San Francisco. So I, I teach the class, I'm in the class and... Uh, this is an exercise class or? The happy body. The happy this body is about class. the got whole it. thing. Mm -hmm. We'll go to the happy body because I didn't finish the happy sure. body yet. Okay. Yeah. Right. There's a lot more to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this woman tells me that he cannot, she cannot find the time to exercise. I said, we cannot find 30 minutes to exercise? No. And she told me, what she does is, okay, tell me. So she, she told me what she does. She has two jobs and she has children and, and she's single and, and her life is really tough. And when she told me, I just, you know, I couldn't say anything. It's just like, it's really uh, a person that struggles, uh, a person that doesn't have time, right? Okay, but, you know, I'm not an easy uh, to give up on things like this. You have to have time, <laughs> especially when something is good. And over time that brings goodness, you have to somehow find time for it. It has to be the way, but I didn't know what was the way. And I'm driving home from San Francisco and I'm, you know, meditating. Something is wrong about that, but I don't know what. I don't know how to grasp that uh, whole situation and uh, how to deal with it. It's the person that is, you know, struggling. The person has, works, you know, uh, almost whole day, has children, has to make money and doesn't have time for exercise for 30 minutes to improve the life through it. So I came home, went to meditation, spent there two or three hours of meditating, I wrote this poem. Let me read it to you now. So the title is, Who Cannot? Every night when I wake up, I walk to the kitchen, and every morning there is still food on my face. How can I stop myself? His coach fought for a moment and then told him, think about all those people who stop themselves from owning and killing and having fun because they finally saw how others suffered. Without them, we would still have slaves, the Holocaust, and a world just for men. Becoming a man like that is your only chance because there is no one else to force you. Don't you expect too much from me? Do you really believe I can be a man like that? Who cannot? So the poem focuses on 
great people in life, those who know that there's something is wrong, and they would not let it go. They would keep doing, even though whatever it was needed to change the situation. So there were two uh, people, two lawyers in uh, England who uh, stopped the slavery. And I watched this documentary. They lost friends, they lost uh, money, they lost almost everything. But they really achieved that place where we didn't have slavery anymore. Amazing, right? So there is something sometimes in us that we see from the moral point of view is something is wrong and we go for it. I came back to San Francisco, read the poem in the class, and people started commenting on it. And it came to the woman and she said, I will never say I cannot to my children anymore. I will rephrase it, but I will not say I cannot. I see now how painful it could be and how, uh, how damaging it could be for my children. And I was sitting here and I was thinking really about, about myself and my, my time. And I saw myself that I watch TV, that I read novels, and I don't have to do. That actually I have time. So you see that uh, the poem helped her to go into the, finally to her own world and accept that she was doing something that she could stop and she could do something else. And on the cover, I just want to, I think it's worth noting, at least on the cover of this, this is the mastering, the Happy Body Mastering Food Choices book, but the the diagram, or I should say rather the illustration is a, is a circle, the circle's cut in half, and one half is white, one half is black, and one half is labeled master, the other is lab- labeled fatalist, and then in the middle there's a small circle, half of which is on either side, and it says choice. Um, so I'd actually like to ask Naval something. So Naval, you and I have talked a lot where I tell you I'm going down to train with Jersey and you're like, no, 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 he's too intense. I, I can't go down there and train. <laughs> and then I talk to Jersey and he's like, how's Naval? God, that guy's so intense. And this this is always what, what goes on. But uh, I remember chatting with you at one point and you said, well, I, I feel like I should just pay to go down and talk to Jersey. Because the training's really expensive, but it's very cheap therapy. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually did that on one occasion where I came down. We just talked for two hours. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a cheap therapist. I mean, it's wisdom, right? Uh, someone like Jersey has uh, encountered huge difficulties in his life, has done world-class things uh, in multiple disciplines. And there's just a, a wisdom to that that I don't think we respect in modern society anymore. We always crave what's new uh, but I would argue that what's old and time tested and proven, you know, when there's someone who's 62 and fit uh, beyond beyond imagination sitting in front of you, that's you should listen to what that person has to say, even if you've heard it before. You can hear it a new way, a new time with a new intensity, and, and it might make a difference. Um, not to cut off your question, but you know, you're talking about choice, right? Master versus fatalist and choice. The single most impactful thing that I've heard from Jersey, there's many, but the one that always stands out is just the philosophy of uh, hard choices, easy life, easy choices, hard life. Mm. Uh, And I think it's worth digging into that a little bit because I think that kind of unites what you're talking about with exercise, with nutrition and with psychology, right? It's kind of the overlying, overarching principle. And it's obvious, but it's not at the same time. It's a practice of it that's hard. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I think that I learned from uh, weightlifting that, that uh, constant search for uh, making something actually difficult that would help you to get better and you search for it. So the progress is, uh, it, it can happen only if you're on the edge when actually is something difficult. So I, I, uh, 
I told a uh, uh, car, car racer in LA about 20 years ago was uh, how the progress racer? how the progress happens. Yeah, he's off road racer, uh, the Baja Thousand. Right. His father was breaking records, and so um, Billy Robertson, really fantastic driver. 20 broken bones and really tough, you know, tough. You cannot get really tougher. This is tough. This is Olympic weightlifting. This is off-road trucks, you know, like uh, 10,000 pounds and, and going 140 miles per hour on uneven terrain. It's just amazing things. So, and, and he was also on the motorcycle, very fast motorcycle, 160, 170 miles per hour. He was, he was racing this stuff, yeah? It's just so... And so he was diverse in his uh, uh, possibilities. And I coached him for, you know, flexibility, power, and, and you know, getting ready for this uh, uh, competitions. So he was, uh, his father was in uh, Baja Thousand, uh, broke uh, the records uh, in 1960 on a motorcycle, 48 hours without stopping. So j j they were just getting gas from helicopters, and he said that when he finished, he couldn't straight his fingers for one week. We were just <laughs> gripping the handlebars, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that. <laughs> so uh, you know, um, so when I talked to him, he said, "You know what? It's it's like this. I understand this this way. So when I when I race the car." So I have to bring the car to the place of when the tires are spinning, losing the traction. And then I slow down to capture the traction. And then I have to speed up again to lose the traction. And on and on and on and on. I can only progress when I am in that area. So that is the same with all athletes and whatever we do, right? So that's the, that's the difficult choice. You, you bring yourself to the losing the traction. So when you uh, imagine, let's say a weightlifter would be the same story. You have to come to the place where the records are and you break the records very little. And if something happens, you go back. Yeah, to catch the traction. When you heal injuries, is the same thing. You you go to the place where it's difficult, and you try to stay there. If the body lets you, you stay there, and you uh, getting stronger in it or more flexible. If you sense that something is wrong, you go back. So the masterpiece is how to find that place. Where is it really? Where is that place? And and you cannot really, because if you spin too much, you completely lose the speed and you lose, right? If you don't bring yourself to that place, then you cannot improve. So the only way to improve would be to have progress, but that progress depends on these difficult choices. And the master masterpiece uh, here is to uh, lose the traction, catch up, lose the traction, catch up. So when you're on the happy body, you're the same way. You are supposed to come always to reach for something more just slightly, you know, like a, a quarter inch or something, and then you know where you are and you're reaching for it. And that, uh, that is the athletic brain. The fitness brain is to exercise without it. So the whole fitness today is just kind of that way. You go to the gym and you just exercise, but you are not really bringing yourself to the, for, for the tires to, 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 to slide. Yeah. So you, you, you're not pushing that direction. You don't know where it is even. And that, because of that, you don't have progress. So I have people who sometimes come here and then, oh, I, I exercised for 10 years and, and I didn't change. Well, there is no change because there is uh, no progress. There is no reaching. There is no uh, hard choices. And so difficult choices, easy life, right? So we are all good with easy choices. Actually, easy choices is fun. You know, like uh, we will always choose what's easy. That comes naturally for us. 
Fantastic. You know, everybody is good, good about that. Everybody can write a book about that. It's a easy choices. So, of course, we will do everything what not difficult. Hmm. Well, because of that, we cannot progress in life, right? But those of us that can choose difficult choices, they will have progress and they will have uh, improvement and they will have easy life because of that. But you have to be okay with it. And I was, I was faced with this first time really in weightlifting. Coach coached me that way. And I got it that, that this, this fine line of searching of, for difficulties, but that difficulties cannot be too much difficulties. It has to be just, just slightly so you get the good feeling, you get better, and then you go to the next day and do the same and get better. And then eventually the quantum shifts happen when you actually progress a lot, right? And then back up a little bit and so on. Well, one analogy that I remember you used with me at one point, which changed my thinking or at least opened my mind to different possibilities with flexibility and mobility. I remember in the beginning, I had terrible ankle mobility, really bad ankle mobility, and it led to all sorts of knee problems and hip problems. And in the many different types of, of training that we've done together, the concept of achieving that flexibility through movement and motions, as opposed to holding static stretches for a long time, was relatively new to me. And I remember at one point you were talking about the, the hinge, a rusty hinge. Right. And how you... You can't try to force it too much. You'll break yeah, it like yeah, a paper exactly. clip. So you go back and forth and it's creak, 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 and it's barely bending and then click and it, and you get a little bit further. And then you oil a little bit and you do creak, 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 <laughs> yeah. creak and then click. And then and then you you have these really unexpected, for me at least, quantum jumps where I would go from feeling stuck, 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 and then next workout, boom, all of a sudden I have three or four inches of additional reach. And uh, that was a new experience for me. It's funny how, uh, you know, uh, things happen to us. Like, yeah, like Naval, you, you said about that. I uh, know so many things and came <laughs> from many things, but we remember things in life. So my father was the locksmith. He was a, a, a steel worker and he was a locksmith. And I remember I was probably five years old and he he was showing me with the rusted drill hinge and how we work with it. It was beautiful. You know, like he put some oil and moved it a little bit, gave me, and I was working with it. I had sense where it was, um, uh, it was stopping and, and helped me to feel how much really to, to push it. It was, I still remember it. And you see like, so when I, talk to you. He was my master. He, he was really showing me how to break that hinge the right way. Not to break it, you know, uh, completely, but to open it, to restore it, to rejuvenate it. And eventually after about half an hour, that hinge was moving with oil and everything like new. It's wild. It's wild. Yeah. yeah. But you know, when you are open to this, you use this metaphor, and I use this metaphor with you, but I remember that my father and working on that hinge, and it's it's a uh, it's it's a juxtaposition, right? And with those juxtapositions, we use constantly in poetry and and uh, in life, yeah, to to help people to imagine. To, so I want to help people to imagine another story, which which I quite enjoyed. So we've we've had. A number of lunches here, and uh, you were just saying before we started recording that I guess in terms of the uh, the units for Weight Watchers, what was it? They're like what are they called? I don't. Oh know, yeah, the yeah, they have thirty points. Points. But so there was a woman before <laughs> <laughs> who who's who's comparing the the diet on the Happy Body, which I guess gives her seven points. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but you eat a very high volume, or I shouldn't say very high volume. You eat primarily vegetables or uh, relatively low protein. And we've had a lot of soup here and uh, delicious vegetable soup, which you also had for breakfast. And we get these gigantic bowls of soup. And I just remember barely starting and scalding hot. 
and I had three or four spoonfuls and you were done with your soup. <laughs> and uh, I'm so, fast, No, I know you are. <laughs> That's so, faster. So, <laughs> then we so, get to the so, minutes. So, so couldn't, <laughs> didn't you, at one point, I could swear you told me this story of meeting someone who claimed to be the fastest oh, yeah, soup eater. Yeah. Could you tell that story? Yeah. So, you know, I was like, you know, very fast eater of hot boiling soup. <laughs> this is in Poland. So this is boiling soup. This is not really uh, uh, hot, yeah? <laughs> so my father was really good in that too, for some reason. So, but I was a lot better than him. I could eat really a bowl of soup, extremely fast, boiling. <laughs> so uh, so when I was a weightlifter in Poland, we had this uh, 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 group of athletes that we hang out and we went to have soup. And we went... Uh, to this uh, uh, bar and we get tomato soup, hot, you know, really steaming. And we started eating. So there, there was this uh, table, long table, and about five of us on one side, about five on the other side, all the, you know, track and field boxers and wrestlers, <laughs> all the athletes, <laughs> weightlifters. <laughs> and I finished. And the guy on the other side of, uh, of the table he looked at me and he was surprised. He said, you finished? You, you ate your soup? I said, yeah, but it cannot be. And I said, what cannot be? And he said, I'm the fastest eater. <laughs> Nobody was ever faster than I. And I said, not anymore. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> I said, I don't, I, I don't believe that you, you just did it. It's impossible. I said, well, come on. You know, you want bad? Oh, everybody was happy about the bats because, you know, weightlifters are always bad, you know? So, athletes say, you know, we bet always, you make it or not? You know, how much and so on. So, um, so we started betting. Yeah. So, uh, we bet. Then, uh, uh, and of course, he ate half of the soup and then I ate the whole thing. Yeah. And that was it. <laughs> but, I did the other story is this. So I go to Warsaw and to, uh, to about fast eating. We go to Warsaw and in Warsaw, uh, I go to the academy, the fire protection academy. And this is my first day. I'm depressed. You're I'm depressed? without my mama. Oh, okay. You know, my mama. <laughs> and that was my mama's son, you know, always. And I, I couldn't really live without my mama, you know, like uh, I was always like making the way that I would be home. <laughs> so I'm sitting and as I'm looking for the place. So I found this place that three guys are sitting and they are from all from Warsaw. And I sat there and they all, the one of them is really this street smart guy, right? So I eat, I eat slowly and so on, but there's not much food, yeah? So everybody wants more food that they really serve. So, so he tells me this, you know what, I have the idea. And I said, what is it? Whoever will finish first will help the other to finish the food. <laughs> so I, I look at him and, said, and I'm just thinking, laughing inside, this is, you just pick up the worst probably person in this world. <laughs> <laughs> He's just just the worst one, that bad, bad one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I said, okay. Next day, he didn't eat, eat his second and dessert. I ate his second and I ate my soup, my second dessert, his, his, his uh, second and dessert. <laughs> Next day, so he started from the second, yeah, like uh, uh, por pork chop and potatoes or something, yeah. So he left the soup. So I ate his soup and dessert. <laughs> so he said, oh, I don't want to do it anymore. I said, well, if you don't want, you have to pay. <laughs> so he paid. It was a lot of money. It was like two months of, uh, of work. But well, that's a lot of we money. We became really great friends. <laughs> when we bet, we bet. <laughs> You know what? One day we were at this uh, 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 Olympic weightlifting uh, seaside during the summer, and they were always bringing food to us. And they uh, brought one day this uh, cabbage stew with meats and so on. In this 
basin, you know, like a really big, probably about maybe 20 pounds of it. And then uh, we always wanted to eat more, of course, so that my friend Otto, I said, you know, we could eat the whole thing. And the others were laughing. It was about 40 guys. And then, uh, you cannot eat this. Uh, yeah, we could. So wait, it was we for could. 40 people, and you and your friend said we could eat the yeah, whole thing. Yeah, we could the whole thing, yeah. <laughs> so we started really laughing. I said, Otto, come on. I said, no, Otto, we cannot eat this. You know, it's just, it's just too much of food. So when you actually put the spoon down vertically, the, only the tip of the spoon was <laughs> was seen. <laughs> and the the basin was between, when we sat in front of us, was between my legs and his legs. It was so big. It was gigantic. Gigantic. And Otto said, we'll, we'll eat it in one hour. <laughs> and everybody <laughs> like, I said, no, come on. And then, oh, come on, Jersey. You know, we'll, we'll eat it. I said, okay, we'll try it. So... <laughs> They were started betting, and the coach said, no, 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 I know you guys. <laughs> <laughs> One hour, no, 30 minutes. I said, no, 30 minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, we set up on eventually 30 minutes. I said, okay. So we ate, and we started eating, and we were fast in this. And then it was about left, maybe, you know, like uh, uh, two pounds left. I couldn't make it. It's just like <laughs> two pounds <laughs> lost a lot the band. Couldn't make wow. it. It's just like full done. That was eleven p.m. Eight in the morning, or seven in the morning. We were back in the restaurant, and Otto was sitting in front of the milk, milk with rice, probably more than a gallon, two gallons, and people were laughing and saying, "Oh, Otto, what do you eat?" Of course, you want to bet? I started betting. Otto ate the whole thing. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> after, after eating about, like, I don't know, it, it is 10, 15 pounds. <laughs> so, so in a way, this is liberating because you're obviously very healthy and fit, but you have an eating disorder. <laughs> well, of course, you know, so... Uh, and, and, you, I, and you love vodka, too. So I, you have I your vices. I love the volume. So, you know, my, my challenge is a master here is coming in. Yeah, so... Uh, you cannot let the fatalist really win with you because if you do, your life is not going to be good. Yeah, so what you want has to happen. But for me, you know, to control the volume is really tough. So I can eat 10 apples within 10, 15 minutes and then another 10, follow with another 10, right? Until I my teeth cannot really make it, so, <laughs> so I stop. So... I had to come out with strategy how to uh, how to eat an apple. So uh, I came out. I told you before. So I came with the really strategy for it. So I I drive with my daughter to Santa Clara from our home to take her to gymnastics. It takes about thirty minutes. So I said, okay, I will take the apple and I will finish that apple there. For me, is a big challenge, but you know, I, I, when I actually achieve that, I switch because I'm a taskmaster. So I switch my brain from taskmaster of eating the apple very fast to actually waiting thirty minutes to eat it. That become my, my task. So uh, actually eating fast the apple became secondary. So now I do it all the time to help myself. And I have a lot of people here my way because people who are social, they are, I call them, you know, like social beasts. Like I, I'm a social beast. I love people. I love to, you know, uh, go for dinners and parties and so on all the time. I'm a social beast. So drinking and eating and so on. So how you can be this and you can be lean and you can be uh, a certain body type and so on. So you have to have data. You have to have a plan. You have to have strategy for that. And you can be, but you can be everything. But you have to have. Uh, some strategies how to deal with it. So I created this uh, timing myself. So I, I will take uh, a prune, let's say, and I will time 
10 minutes. I will finish the prune in 10 minutes. So you, wait for, drink. so you wait for 10 minutes and then you eat it? No, no, no. You take I, 10 I'm, minutes I'm to eating, eat it. I take 10 minutes. Like I take 30 minutes to eat an apple. No, I would not wait. <laughs> but that would not be fair. <laughs> but it, but so, it's a challenge. It's a goal you set for yourself. Challenge is, is good. Yeah. I'm a really taskmaster, yeah. right? You know, like a, a lot of tasks uh, at that time. So it's uh, it's very difficult for us to to be masters in that you predict the time that you are good in ten years or five years. Yeah, I am that that way too. But to get there, you have to be also the master of this small task. So my I am really good in eating and very fast. So so I had to somehow trick myself to be the master with. 30 minutes and uh, the eating as a secondary. So this whole book about, you know, uh, mastering food choices, mastering exercise choices and, and so on, and rest choices, they are the books of dialogues. How I, I came out with this book is that when people were coming here, I heard different voices. Since I am poet, I'm a poet, so I sense the who is talking in, and what is the power of the talk? Is it the fatalist? Is the fatalist really strong or is the master or is the, how much master is there? 60%, 40% fatalist. And I started really hearing this dialogues with, within the, the head, with the, in the mind of the person, of my clients all over, all the time. So I, I got the idea one day to uh, to come out with five different voices, and then one would have the voice of the fatalist, hundred percent voice. So the picture is that the choice is up to the fatalist, hundred percent. This is the most traumatic, uh, you know, uh, uh, traumatic uh, situation for the person. The person cannot come out of the uh, that situation. So the, that's the really dominates, yeah. Dominates suicidal situation, a drug addicts that you cannot come out. You have to have help outside. That's how I was helped uh, in Poland. That Mirek helped me to come out. You you were you were actually an alcoholic. I was before, an alcoholic before you discovered weightlifting, like a real alcoholic. Not I just... was a real alcoholic. Three years, three years losing my uh, every day. I was I was losing my uh, blackout every day. So I was I was blackout sometimes for two three days. I left on, on Wednesday, I came back on Sunday. I didn't know the days were before. I thought it was Thursday. So, and three days, three years like that. And um, so you really have to be lucky. What, how did you get lucky in that situation? What, what got you out of that? Well, that's the, the story, the other story, right? So, the, so I am uh, drinking with uh, my buddies, you know, and um, we are somewhere in the pub, uh, drinking beer and things. And you're like 18 years old at the time, 19, something like that. That was bad. I am 19. Yeah. Yeah. So 18 and a half. So uh, during this talk, when we are talking, there's another guy and he, he's drinking with us. And he says that his mother threw his uh, weightlifting uh, equipment out of the house. and. I said, well, you know, bring, bring all of it to my house. I, and I said, yeah, sure. You know, alcoholics. Alcoholics always say everything, but they don't mean it. <laughs> or the next day, they don't remember, right? <laughs> but next day, I was always already drinking in the morning. So I'm drunk at 3 p.m. On my, on my couch, and there is a knock to the, on the window. And I go there, and I open the window. Mirak is there. I said, what is it? And then he said, I have the equipment. You told me to bring equipment that I can have it and train in your place. Really? I said, OK. I said, Just bring it there. So, but I will take it up. <laughs> so, so he brought everything in, set up everything, and um, but he didn't uh, do his workout on his own. Yeah, 
he, so he tries to pull me in. He said, Jersey, come and do it. We'll do it. But then we we'll go for the beer. Oh, yeah, I was just like, yeah, sleeping, kind of rubbing up and uh, recovering. I said, no, 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 just you go. No, no, let's go. You know, we'll do a little bit and go. Uh, so somehow he was inviting, you know. He created this space for me to walk in the right way. So that's amazing, you know, when that space is created. Um, you know, your, your friend, the doctor, Mike, Michael, oh, the, the, Michael. the doctor, Michael McCullough. Oh, that's right, McCullough, definitely. Mm -hmm. So he said that what we do, we create this possibility for uncomfortable situations to make them comfortable. So that's what happens. And then that's what happened to me, that I didn't want to lift weights and so on, but he invited me the right way. So I did a little bit, we went for the beer, and then next day, kind of the same, we were drinking and then we were lifting. <laughs> and he was kind of well, okay with it. And then, so the days were passing, I was drinking with him, lifting with him and drinking. <laughs> but as months started passing on, I noticed that I was getting stronger because of this lifting and, and stronger and stronger. And my strength was coming back because I was also the lifter between 13 and 15 and a half. That's when I lost. I was in high school and fell really into darkness. So he, uh, training with him, my body was coming back, you know, and my uh, master was waking up. And I start, really uh, started choosing less drinking or uh, drinking not so, uh, not so hard liquor, you know, sometimes not drinking and definitely more exercise. We started really uh, lifting more and lifting more lifting more and after about five six months we were really lifting and i didn't even notice the change so they changed so he he pulled me out of the place he saved my life and actually in full circle your happy body workout helped me stop drinking because huh. it's the only workout that i've ever done where you insisted strangely enough that it has to be done daily and a lot of other people will say, well, if you're doing weights, and there's a light weights component to happy body. Right. It's, it's a, I, I think of it as a combination of weights, yoga, and meditation. But it has to be done seven days a week. And you even said to me at the beginning, I was like, well, what if I go to the gym and do something else? What if I go for a run? What if I sprint? You said, I don't care. Do all of those, but do happy body also. So you have to do it seven days a week. And it's the first thing that I do. It's very convenient because I, I can do it at home with just my weights next to the bed. But if I've been drinking the night before, it's terrible. It's, it becomes an ordeal. So the sure. daily morning habit of the workout breaks the nighttime going out drinking habit. They it's, kind of work in opposites to each other. Yeah, also, you know, it, it is created to deliver the daily hygiene for the body. It's really brushing teeth. So you do the happy body, it was created to have this daily routine every day, every day into the habit and do it. And that that would set up right away your, your mood, better mood, set up the way of uh, becoming better over time, be proud of, of, of that. I call it that what happens to people when they really do it on a daily basis, when they come through the door, Right away, they are happy. If they don't do, they are not happy. It's like with this winning and losing. So when they come, they are happy. And I recognize triple happiness. So I wrote the, in the, I got this in the book, triple happiness. So triple happiness happens when people achieve what they want. Yeah, they get it. And they're happy that they, they, they lost weight or they are more flexible or they are stronger or their posture is better. They're happy because of it. But then after a while, also they are happy because they became the person that could do that, that could achieve that. So they became this uh, 
th this mind of a, of achiever. And once they do really the happy body and they achieve and they become uh, this, uh, this this attractive body, something is attractive about the happy body people because they are not tired, they are not exhausted, they uh, they are happy, and and, and there is something about them that attracts others to them. And so that is the third happiness, because you deliver happiness to the outside. Other people are happy when they look at you. And it's something about you that makes them happy. So <laughs> I, I call it tri triple happiness. <laughs> I like that. You, you get the goal, you become the new person right. on the way to getting the goal, and then you project that to others and maybe inspire them. Inspire that. others, yeah. right. So question to you, Jersey, I know this is a bit of a left turn from what we're talking about right now, but what does your daily diet look like? What types of meals do you have? What do they oh. what do they look like? Well in the in the morning I will have either juice or soup. And what, what type of juice, what type of soup? What it's all vegetable. Usually the the soup is uh, we make vegetarian soups, clear vegetarian. What was in it this morning? What did you have? I had the juice. Oh, yeah, so the juice. What was in the juice this morning? The juice was uh, uh, beets, uh, carrots, celery, uh, spinach, parsley, and ginger. Got so, it. And just one fantastic. glass of juice? or Yeah, one big glass of juice. That was breakfast. Yes. <laughs> yeah. what, is your, what is your favorite breakfast soup? Uh, I love all soups, but potato, when the potato is in the soup, I love it always. It gives... Because we, we make differently soup. We... Uh, we uh, cook, boil in the pressure cooker. That's really fast, and then blend in Vitamix. So it's a uh, puree, mm -hmm. and and the soup, the soup that we make is we put into the pad. Half of it is carrots, onion, celery, and parsley, and other half is parsley. The parsley. Got it. And other half, parsley root. Usually. Oh, parsnip. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the root. And the other half is the flavor of the soup that you want. If you want uh, broccoli soup, broccoli. If you want cauliflower, cauliflower. If you want potatoes, potato soup there. So that makes really strong tomatoes, tomato soup. And you call it that way. So it's fantastic. So you have the base, which you described, yes. and then the flavor, which is the second half within right. the pressure cooker. Yeah, and then... Uh, you, you blend and then you have your soup. So soups usually we have for lunch, usually. We cook always the soup. You have the, uh, what what Daniela did the soup? The, the you are allergic to. Oh, eggplant, <laughs> eggplant right? right. The, one th the one thing that'll what kill me. There? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a challenge. <laughs> yeah, a challenge. <laughs> hope you have, hope you know how to do an emergency so, tracheotomy. Anyway. So, so <laughs> then uh, I have a snack. And the snack usually is either the, the bar that we make. So bars that we make our own bar. This is in the afternoon. Yeah, around 10. Let's say 7 is, let's say, juice or Oh, or I soup. see. Then and you have a bar as a snack. The bar. What are the bars made out of? So the bars are, are made out of uh, apples, chocolate, uh, prunes, uh, all kind of uh, spices like turmeric, can, uh, uh, cinnamon, ginger, then added seeds to that, and the seeds can be uh, uh, flax seeds, uh, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, and then um, it, then everything is mixed to. Uh, we can add some dates to it to uh, to bond everything together, and then I take it out of the uh, food processor and make everything uh, put it together into this bread bread looking uh, thing it looks like a bread and i cut it into pieces you can add after all the nuts to it and uh, whip them in or you can uh, you can mix them in the food processor before it's up to or not to use them at all people today prefer not to use nuts because the belief is that seeds are better for the skin aging and and nails and so on so uh, we have movement towards seeds more than nuts but still we make uh both and then you have soup for lunch yeah and then do you snack again or do you just go at go to dinner at that point no we have uh uh i snow yeah then i have about four o'clock snack okay and no. at four o'clock snack i can have a juice or i can uh, have a 
uh, like prunes or 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 the dry fruit or i have i can have some almonds or use the bar or soup uh, so you know i love soup so i can eat soup you know three times a day yeah <laughs> what is dinner if dinner if... is uh, interesting because dinner could be uh, any combination of the protein and and veggies or any different strategies so now we have different strategies for uh, eating dinner my way so i love potatoes you know so so yesterday i boiled potatoes and i ate potatoes Wait, you just had boiled potatoes Baked potatoes that's so, it yeah okay that's it. so i love potatoes i want more potatoes so it's not even <laughs> volume either so you know we were just in in vegas and 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 my daughter competed in gymnastics so we went to this when i arrived there was nothing to eat i ate french fries so my snack i didn't have my bars i ate french fries <laughs> so <laughs> at 1 p.m went for lunch i ate french fries <laughs> i love french fries <laughs> so if if i can you know uh, eat french fries i will eat french fries i would not eat anything, anything else. made of potatoes so we went to this italian restaurant so yeah we are inside and i read all the menu i don't like anything up there so uh, and there are two other couples and then i go out of the restaurant, go to the, the burger, I my I buy my French fries, bring it back, and I eat over there. One dollar sixty-five cents. That must have gone over well with the restaurant. And I, and I say, who, 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 who are the and say, Well, you know, I love French fries. And truly, my French fries is the best food on this menu. There's nothing better than my French fries. Really, you know, you have French fries, you have potatoes, you have vegetable oil. It's just great food. But when, but when you're eating French fries, you're just eating the French fries. You're yeah, not I having a burger. Eat, you're not having a giant meal where French fries are aside. No. You're you're basically calorie restricting. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I count that too. You know, like uh, I, you see, the happy body is not a diet. The happy body is an approach for people to help them to control calories, volume to achieve. The body they want bigger body smaller body or maintain the body but it gives this uh, uh people way of of manipulating and food and the volume and the time and so on so tech people uh this new generation people uh details people they thrive on the happy body why? Because they love the numbers, they love the quantifying, self-quantifying, all this. So they love this. And the happy body is all numbers. True, yeah? So they really get it right away to the diet, they get to the exercise, they get to the detail of uh, all exercise and the breathing and so on. They love this stuff. It's just, so it's a perfect system for, uh, for independence, self-control, self-coaching, which was created that way uh, 25 years ago, but people were not getting that. You know, my generation was really had difficulties in that. They were more uh, uh, foody, more uh, more toward uh, having fun, but no control. This generation is different. This generation has some kind of emotional intelligence. Uh, is willing to uh, to compromise is willing to, and, and having fun with uh, actually all this quantifying uh, I'd, stuff. I'd love to ask you more about that, especially with the meal replacement stuff like Soylent. But before we get to that, I did want to hear your dinner. Yeah. What are you having for dinner tonight? Oh, I didn't, I never know. So, uh, But like what's an average dinner? What is a protein oh, I, source? Yeah, I love, let's say, size uh, cauliflowers. You know, like if I eat the one thing, it will be either potatoes, cauliflowers, broccoli, I will steam and put the salt on it, eat big, you know, uh, bowl of that. And that's my dinner. So sometimes we make steaks because Natalie uh, eats steaks or fish. So I can eat a little bit of that. So you eat yeah? very little animal protein. Very little. Like, you know, I am like, uh, um, you know, my experience, the different story with the, the with my situation and prostate, so this, which your family has a history of seven prostate. years, yeah, seven oh. years ago, we went to Poland to find out because my grandfather was coming from Białoruś, and so we we went there to 
And nobody could find any trace what happened to the family when my grandfather came to Poland. So we went to, uh, to engage uh, others to go to Belarus and, and find the roots and who, were, who we were, really, yeah? And because there is no trace. So uh, we were there, we were at the cemetery, and my mother had five brothers. And I, uh, uh, I'm standing there and then this family uh, uh, person is telling me that these are the, oh, here, you can see here, there are uh, five, your, your mother's five brothers are there. And they all died at 55 and around that. And they died because of what the same thing. I said, what was it? Prostate cancer. <laughs> Oh, I was 55 <laughs> looking at these graves. I said, well, that's not good news. <laughs> so I, when I came home, boom, I went to my doctor. I said, uh, we need to check, you know, prostate and so on. So she checked and said, well, it's big and it has nodules and, and so on. So I said, oh, not good. So she said, let's do PSA came 9.5 holy moly this is that's a blood not marker good. yes for yeah, prostate yeah. inflammation this is not good so this is what i will talk later on about you know organs health and the uh, physical health yeah so they they are two different things so i uh, i said at that point so she sent me to the uh, urologist and he said we had to do biopsy. I said, no, 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 no. We, we slow down now. Things. <laughs> we, we need to slow down. <laughs> because I, I read also, you know, you, you, you can trust uh, people or not, but some people said that if you make a puncture, you can actually, blood can uh, travel. And actually, if it is cancer there, it can spread it. So I said, oh. That's uh, not a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> so I went to my doctor and I said, okay, give me half a year. Because he said, said, well, if it's the problem, it grows slowly and so on. Give me half a year and we'll come back. So, okay. So I started really researching and, 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 and finding my best way of approaching how to deal from the food point of view. And then at the same time, I sent 23 and me, so find out what my DNA and things and so on. So it comes, and 33 percent chances prostate cancer, first killer. So oh, that's serious stuff. So you do you want to know really uh, what would kill you? Like people say, do I need to know uh, what can kill me? Right, and. Some people don't want to know. I want to know because I, I'm going to do something about that. So if I die, then, uh, then I have to know before that I did everything so I wouldn't. But I don't want to be dying and thinking, oh, if I did that and that and that. I don't want to be that person. So I explored everything possible, started my diet. So no uh, animal protein and uh, strictly vegetarian and uh, also no no grains just you know no grains at all only vegetables fruit and some seeds nuts and making the bars and after half a year psa 5 another half a year 1 another half a year 0 0.1 and it is like this every year. So my doctor checked the prostate. Smooth, nice, beautiful, young. I went back to the urologist. He said, wow, is it the same prostate? I said, yeah, it is the same one. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing to do. It's, uh, it's young, it's smooth, uh, no nodules, nothing. All right. So I, um, I don't know. It's, uh, it's our daughter. She's a, so it could be that when you start aging, like 35 or when you are 50 and 60, you have to start switching to a different way of eating. You have margin for error, narrower and narrower, narrower. So I say, 
when you get older, you have to be more perfect and more perfect and more perfect. And then you, you have to find a way to accept what you need to do to become better. And to accept that, okay, you accept the happy body. Yeah, it's a preventive system and it will help you to prevent weaknesses and so on. It will, but you have to have time for it. So I want to uh, point to something now. So the one thing is strength and fitness, and the other is organs in the body. So there are two different ways. So when you think about the organs, you have it about eating. When you think about uh, fitness, you think about physical training, right? Definitely the organs are aligned toward they are healthy when we have certain body weight, not too big. So uh, any restriction on the diet works very well. So the research points that, uh, that mice that was put on a, a restricted diet would live 40% longer. 40%. We are talking about 60 or 100, right? Yeah, yes. So it has to be some kind of control like food, like I control my volumes. If I didn't control my volumes, huh, I would be 300 pounds very fast. Yeah. So uh, there was a woman. So there was a woman in France who lived 128 years. And when they, so we had this friend from uh, MD geriatrics, from geriatrics, and then he talked to us about that in LA. And he said, when they did autopsy of that woman, all the organs were aged evenly, all right? But he said, when we open somebody that is 70 years old, 80, one organ is done, is killing the body. All others could go for another 50 years. Wow, that pointed me to something, yeah? Pointed to me that wholeness, general uh, way of approaching food is, in, is extremely important. The quality of food is important, even though you eat meats or whatever, but you choose organic and so on. And then the more veggies you eat, the better. When the physical body is created the same way. So I put together the organs with joints. So when you think about joints of the body, they are like organs. When you, your elbow is not good, you cannot do anything almost with the body, yeah. right? It limits you completely. You cannot use the body, you cannot train, you cannot get better. One joint is enough and it ruins your, your training system, it ruins your progress, it ruins your getting better. So the flexibility now is extremely important that you have flexibility everywhere around the joint and so you are not getting the tension from any place. Because once, once the joint gets, uh, once the muscle is on one side of the joint tighter, so it will bring the bones together there. And once it happens, the pressure happens. Once the pressure happens, inflammation happens. Once inflammation happens, arthritis happens. Pain comes in. So the happy body is the system that stretches evenly whole body system. So it's a holistic system, everything, every day. So that's why it's, it, it, it's uh, uh, hygiene, really. And it works really perfectly for athletes because I don't do the same way the happy body as, as people. So for people is every day and they challenge themselves and then they do this routine. But athletes use the happy body as massage. So I do one or two rounds and I'm searching for any tension. So for me, I use like half of the weight that I could. So I work on 50%, maybe 40%. So instead of, you know, 40 pounds dumbbells, I will use 15 or 20 which is very light for me. Uh, but I will have to reach all the capabilities of my body. And sometimes I'm sore somewhere, I'm in pain somewhere, I'm tight somewhere, and the happy body helps me to release it every time. 
And so I coach the same way every athlete to do the same thing. Golfers, I said, you, you play golf, you go to your room and you do one round. Once you do one round, always you will know your body and you know where it gets tighter. And then you will gently work with that tightness to release that tightness. Yeah, you identify your weaknesses as a diagnostic tool with the happy body very quickly. Right. And I, what, one thing that uh, really also opened my eyes was doing the opposite of what I had been, what had been drilled into me over many years. And I'm, there's a lot of rethinking of this over the last five or 10 years since Olympic weightlifting has exploded in popularity. But I suppose one of the 10 commandments of lifting for a long time, at least in the United States, was squat to parallel. Don't go lower. Keep your shin vertical. And uh, my, and my and I had some knee problems. I had a lot of leg tightness, a lot of hamstring issues. And I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on the internet. But once I started focusing on getting maximum mobility in the ankle, the knee, the hip, jutting the knees forward and getting my ass down to my heels, once I started slowly progressing towards that, my knees have never felt better. Because I think in part, I have so much room. I have so much slack that is available to me. I guess the way you put it was, uh, I'm blanking, reserve. I have so much more reserve now than I did before. You know, when, yeah. So, um, to imagine the, uh, the angle that we become, you can, uh, look at runners and they will be all kind of different angles and tightnesses. So when you look at sprinters, the uh, gait is the longest, so uh, they are the most flexible, right? When you look at 400 meter, less flexible, and then one mile, less flexible. Marathon runners would be the least flexible. So uh, when they will squat, they will not even reach parallel level because the quadricep will be very tight, all right? The quadricep. So if you want to really squat down and be really down and uh, uh, sit like, you know, I will sit. So, so Jersey's sitting, You're just, sitting all right? just, just, just to describe here. So Jersey's in socks, perfect, just ass to the ankles, yeah. up, body upright, no discomfort whatsoever. So, yeah. So I'm sitting and I can read the book here, right? <laughs> so uh, I'm sitting there. I'm sitting that way, but imagine that my quadricep is tight. Yeah, that's the Chinese people, you know, like oh, they yeah. sit for thousands of years that way. Yeah, and they don't have a problem with knees yeah. <laughs> at in, all. In Japan, they call that unko zuari, which also, is the shit squat. Also, this is the place where we uh, were like seven years, seven months old or eight, and we were that way. Every one of us. Yeah. Right? So there is no limitations of uh, hips of believing that we are limited and so on. Nobody had. We all were that better in squatting than on standing. So when we stood up, it was just, oh, it was too hard. Yeah, when we were about nine months old, we went back to squatting. It was better to squat and to be there than actually stand. So think about, we were better in, in squatting than standing. For everybody that way. So we can be back, but come back to the knee. So when I sit like that and my quadricep is flexible, then you have patella here, all right? And then you have another ligament here attaching to the bone on both uh, the patella and it's touching uh, right bone. below his kneecap. Yeah. So uh, if, if the quadricep is tight, then presses the patella down and that is inviting for the meniscus problem, yeah? So if the, if the quadricep really is flexible, it never happens. See, I'm 62 years old, weightlifting for almost 50 years, never have knee problems, all right? But when I tell people, they don't want to do what I do. <laughs> they want to do their stuff, and they debate with me that it should be parallel and this. Are you crazy? So uh, <laughs> show me some kind of greatness, and then I will follow it, but if you are talking bananas, then I, I, there's nothing for me to follow because half squat is not good enough. Yeah, this is simply, it's funny, but it's it. Well, and also I should just point out that you're talking about athletes and 
everyday people. And uh, those people listening might imagine, okay, everyday people, they're using super light weights, they're doing this, that, and the other thing. But I've seen videos of another patient of yours, or I shouldn't say, well, in a patient, in, in a way, they're your patients, your students. Yeah. Uh, you showed me a video of a gentleman. I think he came to you. He was a, a a war veteran who had a body brace on because he had so much back pain. I think he had some type of spinal issue that he couldn't move at all. And you showed me a video of him doing a an elevated stiff-legged deadlift. So he's standing on a platform with 315 pounds oh, for, yeah. I think, Great. six repetitions or something. And he's in his 50s or 60s. No, he's in 70s. 70s. <laughs> that's fucking insane. <laughs> but that's the coaching, right? You know, yeah. when you uh, coach the right way, you take 10 years. You did... Uh, you did this uh, podcast with somebody, Aniela told me about, somebody talked about 10 years. Oh, it could have been quite a few people because a lot of them think in those terms. Kind. I mean, the people who are great. Yeah. They, they, well, when you, oh, it was Coach Summers. It was, uh, it was Christopher Summer, who used to be the, the, he was the former national men's gymnastics team sure. coach. So, we, so when I uh, talked to, to you about the coach, about the 10 years, 10 years is just really good time. So when you... Uh, when you have 10 years or five, 10 years, you can really make a lifter, you can make a poet, you can make whoever you want, but you really need that time. So uh, Craig was uh, the one that... Uh, Craig, that's... Craig, yeah. yeah. So he was in Vietnam and grenade exploded near him. And he, uh, he was uh, uh, taken to the hospital and his disc shattered. So they remove all the pieces and sanded the vertebrae and left them that way. So uh, four years after, he is in a brace and he uh, a cane and cannot walk. So he found me in Frank's gym in North Hollywood. He asked me to train. And Frank said, no, you're not going to train this guy. So this guy is... Lawsuits, you know? <laughs> Lawsuits, right, yeah. yeah. Like right away. Just waiting to have, especially with Jersey. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I said, Frank, you know, he's a good guy. Uh, let me bring him here, talk to him. He just needs help. You know, he's not going to do anything, you know, bad to the gym. Uh, he said, okay, bring him in. But he's really t t terrible. You know, it's just like, uh, yeah, it's okay. So, uh, Craig came, I talked to Frank, Craig, so on. And Frank heard uh, Craig and said, okay. So uh, I started training him. He couldn't bend holding this stick. He just, like, maybe f f five degrees bent, and that's okay. it. He was in pain. So at the waist, standing straight, he could only bend forward like five degrees, a yeah, few inches. Just, just pain all the time. He was four years in pain, chronic pain, constantly, without a disc between vertebrae. So I slowly, gradually, the same way, or like with everybody, uh, step by step, work with him, flexibility, flexibility, some movements. And uh, after about... Uh, Two years, he could do stiff legs deadlift all the way down. So his flexibility improved, and then, but the strength was not yet. So I started really working. Once the flexibility is done, your aim is strength. Once the strength is down, speed. Yeah. So that's how the things should progress. So the after about ten years, I brought him to do 315 pounds, stiff legs deadlift. I showed you the video, yeah? Yeah, and just so people understand, this is a really low stiff leg deadlift. This, oh, yeah. this touching, is not to the thighs. Touching the, the, the feet. Yeah, that's, that's how touching low the bar there. to yeah, the feet. Yeah, yeah, with the bar, 315 pounds. This is the guy, you know, uh, he was uh, injured. His life completely changed, you know. He became better than ever, really, yeah? So every year, he asked me to come and do the video now, because when we left, and uh, when we left, so uh, we are here, so I don't coach him, so. You once moved he, from Southern so, California But to he knows what Northern to do, he, he does his training, and he keeps his 315 pounds, he's 72 or 73, still does his 315 pounds, the way that I taught him. It's amazing, it's amazing to see it. 
very happy, uh, confident, you know, uh, have a good life, you know, and then uh, he wouldn't, right? So it's, it's fantastic. It's a great story. What would you say to someone who's saying they're training in a gym, they want to take this approach, but they feel impatient because they have people around them who are throwing a lot of heavy weight around and maybe they feel insecure about using light weights or working on flexibility. What do you, what do you say to that person? Well, you're talking about trainer, like, or the person? No, no, to, to a, uh, not a coach, but to, to somebody who's, they want to improve, but this is very common in the U S where people get impatient. They want to do muscle ups tomorrow, or they want to do Olympic snatch with body weight tomorrow. I, I, I don't know, but you know, I am, um, you know, I'm a, like a wolf, you know, like I pee around and then make my space. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we train in a, a gold gym. I had a weightlifting team. And this is in Venice? Or? In Venice, yeah. So we were there for about four years. I had a team before I moved my team to UCLA. And um, so people were like you said. So I started throwing uh, weights on the ground, like, Boom, boom, boom. So it would be kind of dangerous for others to come in. Yeah. So it created my space. <laughs> and, I, and I said, why are you throwing weights? So I said, well, you know, it's just preventive, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> so Form people, a perimeter people, people don't of come in, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you have to learn to stunt your way. You have to become like a vegetarian that you don't eat other food and nobody is going to change you. So you have to become the same way everywhere. You have to have your way. If you are the happy body, you are the happy body. You connect, focus completely on what you do and keep doing that. It doesn't matter what people think. It, what really matters is, are you getting better because of what you do? Result, are results there? Is the progress there? It's more important, more interesting that to know uh, that, somebody doesn't like you or some something uh, you don't have space you always have space yeah so it's uh, i ne i'm never interested in uh, knowing why i am fat I'm more interesting how to get lean right yeah? i'm right. not interested how to get poor i'm interested how to get rich yeah so so it's a, your focus should be always toward that positive thing that you want to you know uh, somebody wrote a book uh, how not to write. Yeah. Does it mean you know how to write? It, it's funny people. They think that if they know how we get fat, they assume that we know how to be lean. Oh, it's a completely different story. Not the same. <laughs> yeah. Not the same. So why to waste your time on uh, doing something what you don't like or the message and knowledge that you can get, they cannot use at all. Mm -hmm. Right? So you have to stand your ground. Uh, and wherever you are, you have to be the happy body. You have to know that you are the happy body. What it means? It means eating this way, this way, that way, in, and exercising this, this way, that way. Wherever you are, it really doesn't matter. You go to the hotel, you pick up two bottles of water, you do the training. Yeah, You go to the gym, you do the training. If people are pissed off a little bit, well, you keep training. So don't focus on them, whatever they are doing. Just keep doing your way and not don't focus on, on too much on people, whatever they... So it's more important is that you do the training. And, and more important is that you are calm and not too angry because, you know, once you focus on that, you become that. And it's not a good energy, really. So you just be meditative with what you do and they will leave you alone, right? Because nothing to do with you. If you're a vegetarian... I cannot do anything about you, yeah? But in 80s, people would challenge you. You know, they would try to convert you back. It, but that's how it was. You know, you, you, you were vegetarian. People didn't like it. You know, they, they, oh, come on, this and that. Yeah. Today, no. They passed. That. At least in California. <laughs> At least, <laughs> maybe somewhere else. So qu know. just a quick question on, you mentioned anger and being relaxed. One of the things that's very different about training here, as opposed to say in a gym or with most coaches, is the very end of the workout or the session. So you bring people into a room, very comfortable room, you have them lay down, maybe put a, a light blanket on them, you, you spray, what is it that you spray on them? Lavender oil. Lavender oil, and then you turn on classical music, 
and you have them lay down for a few minutes until the end of a song. Why? What so, is what is the purpose, and what why are what are the different components? Of so imagine that uh, it's it's is imagine that I am twenty years ago in the World Gym uh, in Burbank and and coaching um, in North Hollywood Gym and coaching Billy Blank that created the Taibo. Uh, Taibo. Uh, Thomas Griffithin, he was in Karate Kid uh, Free and other Taekwondo guys, powerful guys. I put everybody on the ground in the gym and they finish five minutes the music. They love this. Toughest guys, the boxers and so on. They love this five minutes. So why I came out with it? Because, you know, like I needed something to calm down people. And in weightlifting, we do the whole um, uh, recovery system. And the recovery system is sauna, ice baths, and all that helps you to, to pacify and, and to recover for the next day. So I thought about what could be for use for people. And that was the time when uh, we meditated. We did TM and we look, we, we look for other uh, forms of meditation. And we were exploring a lot of music and effective music on, on people. And uh, uh, we like the music and meditation and the music idea. So uh, yeah, I, uh, I collected 11 pieces of music that I thought that we could use as mantra uh, for people to switch the sympathetic nervous system to para. And what also was the situation that people were, would go home and after the training, they were too excited and that they could pick up fights and not be nice to each other and kind. But so I wanted to fix that. And the, the way to fix it, I couldn't send them to saunas and because it was not there. So I, I came out with the meditation, but not really meditation because people like relaxation. So I call it relaxation in the book. And then uh, five minutes of uh, uh, music that would be perfect. And five minutes people would Put up with it. So I found a piece of music that had profound effect on me. And it was like a poem that I can read a thousand times and I'm never tired of it. And every time it gives me something. And the, 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 the art is that way. If it's really art, powerful art, it's forever. It, it's, it's, um, it's always different and forever. I can read poem, you know, hundred times, thousand times, and I read it always anew, and always something happens to me. So with the same, the that piece of music was. What is the piece of music? It's a Thais meditation by Budapest Orchestra. So the what meditation? Thais, Thais How meditation. Thais like T H A I S. Okay. Thais meditation and so it's a mesonet it's a really uh, composer I think from 1800s and uh, he created that piece of music at that time so it's not like <laughs> it's something new I never liked new age music because <laughs> it, it would make me numb and, and and I didn't feel anything and it's like nothing was happening one time me. I tried to Boring. use my own music for the meditation and Jordi said no you use happy body music <laughs> <laughs> so um okay yeah you, if you're at jersey's house it's jersey's way <laughs> well you know it's not my way it's like oh, I know. This, 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 it's the, tuned it's the perfected yeah. way, you know? <laughs> actually this is the best thing that i found so uh and you know in a way um in a way you you should trust the master or you should trust you know uh somebody that lives for 50 years and, and is a poet and pick up that thing yeah all right you don't have to but if you can come out with your five minutes it's fine i'm okay with it i, I would test it anyway yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you know the the five minutes the piece of music becomes uh becomes a mantra after a while so this five minutes at the beginning you you can open your eyes you are irritated and so on but after a month or two, you get calmer and you relax faster. And so that switch from sympathetic nervous system to para 
is quicker. You calm down. And after two years, you hear this music and you already calm down. It's like mantra. You know, I don't even have to say my mantra. I'm, if I sit, I close my eyes. I'm almost there. It just happens. But, be, but at the beginning, at the beginning was that I had to repeat my mantra 200 times to get, you know, even half a second gap of silence in my brain, right? So now I don't have to unless I, I do it. So this five minutes works the same way. So our um, so after why it becomes more and more powerful, it calms you down and it's used for that purpose. So you build that association. And if you have something important in life, you listen to it just before and you do it. Yeah. So it calms you down. You have exam or something, then you listen to that and you go to the exam. So you relax to the point that your memory is open because that's what happens. You need to open your memory, but you open your memory in the best way when you are calmed down. If you have any kind of anxiety, your test is not going to be good, right? So, and the other thing is that your recovery process is kicking in. It means you, the digesting system is returning and you, you re start recovering the body after training. So after uh, a, a story about this, funny story is our happy body people are going to get married and, they, and we go there and they chose to play this music when they walk out and they, they, <laughs> they just before they and then the music is played and and there are other like 20 people with a happy body and everybody is looking around because they they know the music and they are so happy you know everything is just this <laughs> happiness uh, the music brings in yeah. but also depth of that music and the meaning of that music is is outstanding. Uh, I don't know what, how, how they feel about this. Uh, I, I like it. I, I think there's also a Pavlovian response where if you just start associating with relaxation, then you just have to hear a little bit and you're relaxed. It's just like you're talking about with the mantra as well. Um, but yeah, it's a good use of music. So we could keep talking for hours and hours. We've got birds, cats, dogs, rain, tea. Right. We've, got, okay. we've got everything going on. And we could talk for hours and hours. I think this is probably... Uh, a good place to to put a temporary pause on this this session, and we'll do maybe a round two if people enjoy it, which I suspect they will. Jersey, where can people find more about the Happy Body and everything that you're up to? Is there a particular website that you'd suggest? Probably they go Amazon to? is the best. Amazon, uh, the the books are there. All the books on Amazon, uh, also on iTunes, but. Uh, Amazon uses now really great ebook uh, system that is fixed layout. Right. And our book is fantastic for it. And it was not like that, you know, uh, seven years ago when we con you you needed really conversion and problems and so on. Now, they they have the uh, their own app that uh, outlined the whole thing, fixed layout, and you have on on Kindle. And it's there. It's amazing. And it's beautiful. Wow. You know, I said, holy moly, that looks cool. So, so, <laughs> so you would recommend starting with the Happy Body book. The, yes. There's a hardcover. Well, you yeah. know, uh, okay, a little bit about the, the book. The, the book, the main book is the, is, is the plan, is the goals and is the plan and it's intelligence. And it has everything uh, with strategies and intelligence built in. Uh, okay, that's... Uh, Engineering, engineering, right? So then, people need emotionally, uh, emotional intelligence. They they need something that would help them on the road. They need something to build transitions from the one that uh, runs marathon to to the happy body or to sprinting. And we need those tra transitions built up. And it's not it's not going to be. Uh, to be easy it's not going to difficult choices again so if i am on in front of two potatoes and one and i know that one is enough for me and two is too much that i have respond to that i either have respond of the fatalist that says 
Oh, come on, one potato is starving. Eat two potatoes, yeah? But master says, well, but we calculate it. One is enough, and you will be happy after because you will not get fat. Oh, come on, fat, you know, well, only you live only once, yeah? So why not two? Uh, maybe three is good. That <laughs> would be better. So you have uh, constant this situations and then a, a day you can maybe have 100 different uh, possibilities to make a choice and you can make as a fatalist or the master all the master books are, are written to trick the fatalist really so when you come to the uh, middle level when you have 50% fatalist and 50% master the dialogues in the book end up with the master tricking the fatalist. And that makes the 51% master and 49% fatalist. It means you will choose one potato, right? It will be difficult, it will be tough. We know it's tough. You know, it's tough to be, become better in, doesn't matter what is that. It's always difficult. That's why it's easy life, because when you do, the life becomes easy because of it. So uh, th there are, in every book, there are 12 different dialogues that prepare you to different situations. The book doesn't end up on that. It also gets you to writing your own dialogues, writing your own ways. How would you write about, you know, potatoes and choices with 75% fatalist and 25% master and then 50-50 and so on. So you, you explore your own mind, your own attitude your own way of thinking. And it helps you eventually to lean toward being a master. Once you are there, then you achieve anything what you really want. You can achieve the happy body, really, because you will be okay with uh, eating on time, but, let's say at three o'clock. But if you're not okay, fatally, you say, I'm not a monkey, I'm not going to eat uh, at three or two and one. What is it about that? I am free man, I want to eat whenever I want. That's the fatalist, right? So uh, the master said, whoa, 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 we have a plan here. What plan? I don't want any plan. <laughs> right? Of course. <laughs> so uh, Plato gave us fantastic image. He said, if the chariot is the body and the horses are our emotions and the rider is our mind, so if the horses are dragging the rider, Against his will, danger is coming. It's fantastic. You know, it's a, it's, it, it tells you everything about, you know, whatever you want to achieve, that paying attention to our emotion, working with them is important because horses are great. They are just wild and they want their own way, right? Like my eating uh, 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 10 apples or 20 apples. So I have great horses. But also, I need that mind would control my horses. If I do that, that I go really great, yeah? Because great horses. So don't punish the horses, yeah? Don't really uh, um, do something to these horses or calm them down in a way that you would give them drugs. No. Use the horses, but turn them where you want to go. Direct. And then when you, when you do that, you can achieve a lot because they are great horses. So you have other book of poetry, you have this three, and then there is a one that we've written uh, with Natalie, uh, with Anila recently. I, I got this. This is the book that is a collection of stories because stories are important, you know, like um, there's so many people here and they say, you know, you have this way of, telling the right words to the right person in the right time over and over. Oh, what is it, you know? And, and I say, nobody can say what is it and nobody can use it. There is no method for that. So, so what is it? And it's in the story. Somehow the story works that way and the ambience where you are in the story is working. So it's opening a possibility to, to agree in the story with somebody who is tricking the fatalist, yeah, and becoming the master. So it's a collection of the stories, but the stories are connected to uh, the happy body. And 
collections of lectures. I have lectures that are like Triple Happiness is one of the lectures, yeah, inside. And then there is a, a, a 12 poems from this book. The whole reading is designed, is, the purpose is to, for people to read over and over. Because, you know, we live around uh, people that they are uh, not uh, masters, they are uh, the opposite of it. And we have sometimes masters around. So, so the, our purpose would be to find masters, find a way how to be around masters, how to be around people that are positive, how to, uh, how to read books that are positive, how to watch movies that are positive. Yeah, but positive, always positive. And usually American movie ends on positive, which is good. It's fantastic. It's supposed to be that way because it gives you this feeling that at the end we're okay. It's important. So every dialogue ends up that way because this is a fantastic way of uh, making the brain, the mind, the way that will turn every situation, will find the strategy, strategy with, within every situation to be positive, to use it positively. All the, you know, when, when you read, you know, the whole uh, introduction, you see that so many bad things happen. But every bad thing can turn into a good thing if you do it. Because... There's a way to make it happen that way. So there's no end of the world. So I, that's why I said the past doesn't exist. It's what exists. It's now. What do we do now counts. Yeah. What, 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 what is it that we do? It, it becomes past anyway, right? But once it becomes, more interesting is what now? What we are doing now? We are drinking tea. We are talking to some people that will listen to it. That's what we are doing. But in one hour, it will be the past, right? So, but then it will be in that time, you have to be there and not here, right? You, you have to be in your time zone because in only in the present, you can change. It can get better. So you, when you do the training, you are doing the training. When you eat apple, an apple, you eat an apple, right? So you are there. When you listen to the music, you listen to the music. You are present. That's mindfulness. That's what exactly is. And to, uh, to really uh, embrace yourself with everything what's possible in life, what's positive, is, is extremely important. That's people and books and, and whatever it is. But try to be around people who, who don't do three things. They are not sarcastic. They, are, they don't complain and they don't blame. They don't it, blame. Blame. The three killers, you know, of happiness. It's, it's just uh, get out of that. So and can you then, say this one more time? Sarcasm, complaining, blaming. No yeah. sarcasm, no complaining, no blaming. Yeah, it's just if you if you can do that, and you know a lot of people that come here, they hang on on that, and once I turn them around, that they will stop doing this, they become so happy in life because they focus on that what is really positive about their children, about uh, what they do at that moment, and so you can always find that. It's 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 just you 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 have to stop one thing complaining that Trump is there, right? Because you have so many people here they don't like Trump. I said, I say, listen, he is the president. We will be the president. Find what's positive. There must be something positive. And focus on that. Don't focus on negative stuff. Focus on positive. Where is it? And once you explore positive, good things, then something happens. But it's very difficult, right? It's, it's easy to read the book and be negative about the book. It's not easy to read the book and talk good about the book yeah. because you have to somehow have a craft of saying why the book is good. Yeah. So, so whatever is not good in life is easy for us. Whatever is good is difficult. Yeah. That what takes us and makes us better. So I think it's a, I think it's a skill 
it's a practice like we've talked about and uh this has been extremely fun so jersey first and foremost thanks for everything that you do and uh I thank encourage... you for being here of course <laughs> you, and you uh... made that uh the place you know you bless the place <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hope that you will come and bless it again. <laughs> <laughs> I will be sure to come back and embarrass myself and get yelled at because I need that as my medicine. Uh, Naval, any any parting thoughts or comments? Uh, I, I think you've got a lot from Jersey. There's a lot of wisdom here. The, the only part that maybe we didn't cover that maybe something in the future is I know that uh, no man is an island. And Jersey's here because of three amazing women in his life. And that's probably what kept you from being an alcoholic or uh, a student martyr of some sort. Um, so we'll have to cover that in the future. But his wife, Aniela, is every bit as amazing. I encourage you to research her and read about her in the Happy Body book also. Yeah. Um, I would say, even though it's Happy Body, uh, Jersey gave me a second body, which is how I describe it oh, sometimes to people because my first body wasn't that great. I like the second one a lot better. Uh, and I'll keep improving it. Now that he said it takes 10 years and I have no one to blame but myself, then it gives me the inspiration to keep going. So thanks, Jersey. Oh, you're welcome. Second body, I like second body because, uh, so I, I see that first 50 years is first body, but also it's the nature versus nurture. So you have the nature, you use the body, you don't care, you, you just, the body is fantastic, is is restoring itself, is recovering itself, and, and, and it's very, very forgiving. The next 50 years is nurture. It's time to be intelligent. It's time to be, uh, to have goals. It's time to have plans. It, it, it's time for that. So if we start nurturing the body, we can easily go for another 50, right? And that's our second second body and then uh, there is all there, there is the this gracefulness on the on the road that we really need, need to learn and once you get that gracefulness then you can uh, the, your journey can be pleasant your journey can be progressive and your journey can be joyful and you know and you don't have to wait until you get become the happy body. Like you go to a college and and you complain all the time because you know it, you have you cannot have parties, you have to study, and it will be eight years before before you MD, and then you will be happy. Well, you'll not be happy. So you because you know once you become MD, you will be happy for a while, and then something else comes in, and then it, so it's very important that you are happy in that moment present moment present moment my biggest success is always like when i have a good time when i don't have a hangover after people you know i used to have hangovers of the people uh, 20 years ago or 30 <laughs> but they don't have like a, a spiritual hangover after hang, you spend hangover, time with yeah them. like hangover you know you don't know what happens to you but when you talk to people you don't have a good time right so i don't have these things anymore you know like uh, uh I have a mindful uh, connection to people and dinners with people that they are really good people too. So uh, to have a dinner with friends and not to have hangover and have a good time, I think this is the biggest success you can have in your life. Because, you know, you can be rich and no friends, right? Or no true friends and no present moment. Uh, but, you know, when you go with four people into a restaurant and everyone is present, everybody enjoys the walk and sitting at the table and having a uh, tea or drink and uh, dinner and is kind and nice to the waiter. And uh, you, you start conversing about things and you are uh, care for things and so on. And then, and then something happens to you because of the conversation, something positive happens, uh, what more it could be in life, right? Agreed. You're good. You, 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 you got that. <laughs> <laughs> Checks the box. Uh, well, we, we have a lot of other things that we, we could cover that we should cover at some point. I agree on Aniela, who uh, 
is just an incredible woman. And I remember wow. who still My three women. Who, who can still climb a tree that I'd be terrified to climb to get a kite out or a ball out or a frisbee out and uh, has that incredible physical physicality that is nurture at this point that she can show to your daughter. And it's, it's just, it's incredible yeah. all around. And what, what I'd uh, like to end on here is a, as everybody knows, who's listened to this podcast a lot, you can find show notes, links to the different happy body books and uh, much more, maybe some videos of Jersey at uh, fourhourworkweek.com forward slash podcast for this episode and every other episode. If you want to use the new shorter URL, you could try tim.blog forward slash podcast, and that'll take you to the same place. And uh, I think we can put a pin in it with the quote that Naval brought up from Jersey, hard choices, easy life, easy choices, hard life. So Jersey, thank you so much for taking the time. Right. Thank you. It was fun. Thanks, Naval. And uh, to everybody listening, until next time, thank you. Work smart train smart and play often hey guys this is tim again just a few more things before you take off number one this is five bullet friday do you want to get a short email from me or would you enjoy getting a short email from me every friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend and five bullet friday is a very short email where i share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out, just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out, and just drop in your email, and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by Wealthfront. Wealthfront is the future of financial advice. They've become incredibly popular among my friends in Silicon Valley and across the country because they provide the same high-end financial advice that the best private wealth managers deliver to the ultra-wealthy, but for any account size and at a fraction of the cost. For instance, they monitor your portfolio every day across more than a dozen asset classes to look for opportunities to rebalance or harvest tax losses. Now, would you do the same? Are you doing the same? Probably not. And the power is in the software. Wealthfront now manages more than $4 billion in assets, which is up from around $2.5 billion when they started advertising on this podcast. They're growing incredibly quickly. Unlike old-fashioned private wealth managers, Wealthfront is powered by innovative technology, making it the most tax-efficient, low-cost, hassle-free way to invest. They don't have bloated sales teams or retail locations, so they can deliver all of this sophisticated financial advice and these services at a fraction of the cost of a traditional financial advisor. So at the very least, go to wealthfront.com forward slash Tim and take their free risk assessment survey. It only takes a couple of minutes and Wealthfront will recommend a personalized portfolio of investments. In other words, they'll tell you exactly where they would put your money. So even if you don't use their service, you have a huge leg up and you have additional information for making good decisions. They use investment theory to automate good financial behavior and decisions that people typically don't make but should. So go to wealthfront.com forward slash Tim to get your first 15K managed for free or just to get more details. Check it out, wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. This episode is brought to you by Audible, which I've used for many, many years. I absolutely love audiobooks, and they are one of my favorite ways to pass the time when I travel. I'm on the road all the time, and Audible allows me to consume many more books than I possibly could otherwise. I have two audiobooks to recommend right off the bat. The first is perhaps my favorite audiobook of all time, and it's the only audiobook I've wanted to listen to twice in a row, The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. It's amazing, and you will thank me. There are a few different versions. I like the version that Neil narrates himself. One of the most soothing voices of all time. The second book is Vagabonding by Rolf Potts, P-O-T-T-S, which had a huge impact on my life and formed the basis for a lot of what would later become the four-hour work week. So go to audible.com forward slash Tim and you can choose one of these two books or any of many, many other options. That could be books, magazines, and much more. As a listener of The Tim Ferriss Show, you can also access a free 30-day trial. Just go to audible.com forward slash Tim. 
You can't make more time, but you can make the most of it. So turn your travel or your commute into something more with a free trial at Audible. Go to audible.com forward slash Tim to start now and get your free 30-day trial.